<laughs> Welcome everyone to the City Council public hearing for January 20th. Uh, the first public, we have two public hearings this evening. The first one is an ordinance concerning public passenger vehicles. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. This public hearing is an opportunity to, for the public to provide feedback to the Eugene City Council on proposed changes to the city's public passenger vehicle code. Public passenger vehicle regulations are designed to ensure that the public safety is protected, public needs are met, and public convenience is promoted. These regulations serve to provide a safety net for the protection of users. The purpose of the proposed changes is to update the code to acknowledge the emergence of new technologies and business models while also ensuring all public passenger vehicles operating Eugene meet community safety standards. The pro proposed changes allow fair calculations using smartphone applications. Additionally, even though we believe that the city's current public passenger vehicle code provisions require companies like Uber and Lyft to obtain a pack public passenger vehicle company license, code amendments are proposed that would clearly require these types of businesses to obtain a PPV license from the City of Eugene to operate. Thank you, City Manager. So those wishing to speak during the public hearing must submit a completed request to speak form to the information desk prior to the beginning of the public hearing. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. You will have three minutes to comment, but don't feel compelled to use it all. Uh, there are lights on the timer. The red light indicates the end of three minutes, and I'm going to officially open the hearing here. And uh, first person, we have 32 people signed up for this one. First up is Jim Conlon, followed by Montico Bunner. Here. You have a choice. You can stand or sit, whichever you're more comfortable with. Okay. Um, my name is Jim Conlon. I'm a resident of Springfield. Um, Excuse me, Jim, can you lift that microphone up? You can actually pick it up off the podium if you want. Okay. There we go. My name is Jim Conlon. Uh, I'm a resident of Springfield. Um, I've been in the taxi business with Oregon Taxi for well, about eight years now. Um, my concern is feedback I get from the public and public safety um, and that the regulations uh, respect the public and us being consistent where that not just anybody can have a smartphone and a car and consider themselves a taxi driver. There's so much more involved in it than that. Um, anyway, uh, so I just compliance for everyone. I think that's, that's the key. Cut it short. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Montica Bonner is next, followed by Andrew Graham. Hello, my name is Montica Bonner, and I'm a resident of Eugene. I'm not sure what ward. Um, I am also a taxi driver with Oregon Taxi. I've been in the taxi business for about five years. I own my own taxi. Um, tonight, my fellow taxi drivers and I are here to share our concerns. What we do is pretty simple. Uh, a customer calls, we go pick them up, we take them from A to B, we get paid, we move on to the next customer. This is basically the same thing that an Uber driver does or a Lyft driver does. As taxi drivers, we get paid or we don't get paid hourly. We get paid by the fare, um, the same as an Uber or a Lyft driver. They don't get paid hourly. The difference is, for us, we are regulated and held to certain standards. As a driver, we have to pay 35 to $70 a year to get our permit to be able to drive. As an owner, I have to pay at least $100, well, not at least, up to $100 uh, twice a year to get my vehicle inspected for safety and maintenance. I have to have it inspected at the airport and get a sticker with another fee. Uh, we have to paint our vehicles, which is quite a cost to match so that each company has a matching fleet. We have to pay for vinyl lettering that clearly displays our fees to our customers. And uh, we have fixed rates that are regulated by the city. We can't bounce our rates around depending on the, uh, the business that's happening at the time. 
And, and this is important, and all of these regulations are very important for not only for us, but they're important for our customers. Because Uber wants to be free to, to um, charge whatever they want. And on their website, they describe their surge pricing. And, excuse me, let's see. It says, uh, It says, applicable to certain geographical areas may increase substantially during times of high demand for their services. And so for us, we want our 83-year-old grandmother that we give a ride to three times a week from home to the store to pay her $10 every trip, every time, no matter when it is she goes. If Uber has their way and they can operate in our city, our 83-year-old grandmother is going to pay 15 to 20 dollars for that same ride on a Saturday during a home duck game. Our loyal duck fans are going to get gouged when they get out of the game and prices surge, and they're paying Thank twice the amount. Thank you. Next up is Andrew Graham, followed by Tracy Cook. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrew Graham. I live in Eugene, 2445 Tyler Street. I'm co-owner and president of Biotaxi LLC. My company is locally owned and operated and consists of a fleet of four vehicles, 10 employees, and some eight professional drivers. We've been serving the cities of Eugene and Springfield since 2009. Biotaxi is an innovative company that runs its entire fleet on locally produced non-toxic biodiesel fuel. We pride ourselves in providing a transportation service that protects both the public safety and the environment. Our company works hard to serve the public good, complying with all ordinances designed to provide safe, reliable, and affordable transportation services to the entire local community whenever and wherever they need it at a fair and regulated price. We have also willingly borne the considerable costs and time and money of complying with all applicable ordinances ever since the first day we started, May 1st, 2009. We share your concerns for the safety of Eugene Springfield taxi passengers and have made safety, security, and dependability our top priorities. Our management, drivers, and their families appreciate the city's attention to this matter and your efforts to update the PPV ordinance while calling for compliance by all transportation providers. However, we are concerned to see unlicensed and illegal drivers continuing to operate without certification, inspection, background checks, and perhaps even insurance upon our streets with apparent impunity. We support the proposed amendments to update the ordinance to reflect advancements in technologies, but only with the enforcement that must accompany them in order for the city to maintain a level playing field critical for a healthy taxi industry. We ask for your continued support in protecting the historical safety, security, and healthy competition of taxi services in our community and a level playing field for its willingly licensed, permitted, insured, and compliant business participants. Mayor Piercy, city councilors and staff, as you consider the proposed PBV ordinance amendments, we ask that you also take into account the need for robust enforcement actions to ensure compliance with existing and any new ordinance requirements. Thank you for your consideration on this matter. Thank you. Next up is Tracy Cook, followed by Jennifer Lee. I feel like this legislation has us focused. Would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Tracy Cook. I'm a taxi driver and a concerned resident. I feel like this legislation has us focused 180 degrees in the wrong direction. I feel like we have to move miles northward as far as protecting our community from predatory corporate interests. And this, talking about this language, just kind of has us considering and debating two steps backwards towards the, towards the south. I don't know if you've heard, but Uber is a really bad company. Their CEO has been quoted calling his female drivers akin to prostitutes. Uber drivers have tried to form unions and been laughed out of negotiating rooms. Their drivers 
often have bad things to say about being Uber drivers, yet they don't say so out of fear of retaliation from Uber because they treat their drivers like garbage and fire them without review. But I want to focus on the main thing, which is the insurance. This was the first red flag I ever thought about. If I were an Uber driver and I got into an accident, they would ask me to put it on my own personal insurance. So think what that would probably tempt me to do, commit insurance fraud and not admit that I was a taxi driver at the time of the accident so my insurance doesn't drop me, or I could be honest, have my insurance drop me and, or possibly start charging me an extra $500 a month to keep my coverage. But that's just from the driver's perspective. I'm trying to show how they don't treat their employees properly. Also consider they do have backup insurance, but there was the case in San Francisco where a 10-year-old girl was killed by an Uber driver, and Uber wouldn't pay for it because the Uber driver didn't have a passenger in the car at the time. Their insurance won't cover that. This has launched a lot of states to race towards drafting legislation to force Uber to actually pay proper insurance rates but what have they done? They've hired lawyers and they're fighting each state individually, tooth and nail, so that they don't have to play fairly. So I'm trying to paint a picture so that you're not taken in by their marketing, because they'll have you believe that they're a rideshare. They're not even really a rideshare. That's not about somebody going somewhere and deciding to get somebody else to go on the ride with them and share the cost. It's a taxi app. Let's be honest. It's not a ride share. It's a taxi app. They have passengers, find drivers, and pay fares for them. They're also not a rogue upstart. They're big business as usual. They're worth billions of dollars, and they use all their money and capital to go into a local market and smash open the doors and give away free rides, and free candy, and free water to all their passengers for a month to try and seduce market share away from the people, and then they take 20% of those fares evaporates from the community, goes to Uber, and we don't see it again because it goes towards their global agenda. So in considering stuff like this, don't think of Uber, think of what the local taxi companies have to say. Thanks. They're part of this community. Next up is Jennifer Lee, followed by David Bowden. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm from Eugene. I think I live in the Bethel Ward. <laughs> um, I was an auto claims adjuster for over six years with a major insurance company, so I was dealing with fatalities and large losses, things that are driven by DUIs. Um, and so I also brought my son. As a parent, um, I want to see that we minimize impaired drivers on the road to every extent possible, especially considering the legalization of marijuana that's coming out. We're going to have a whole new slew of impaired drivers out there competing for cabs. I also grew up in Eugene or in, went to college here, so I've also gone through that experience of peak times like Halloween, New Year's Eve, waiting for a cab for two and a half hours, and they're simply not accessible. When ride-sharing services become accessible, on-demand drivers can come and respond to people trying to get out of Bermuda, get out of certain party situations without having to make that decision, do I wait two and a half hours or do I get behind the wheel of a car? So um, I really got into the ride sharing thing just thinking about how it could reduce the number of impaired drivers on the road. I've done a lot of research on Uber, Lyft, Sidecar, all the different apps that are out there right now. And from the preliminary research I've done, DUIs have been reduced in every single region that this has been launched in because they can get that on-demand um, access to a safe ride home. Um, I think that there's a lot of misconception about what this industry is about and the level of regulation and insurance coverage that applies. And it's because it's a new industry and it's changing. So it's, they're catching up is what I see. So from what I've seen, there are umbrella policies in place that protect you know, users on the road when they're in the drive mode. Um, I think that it's an industry that can be responsible, is accessible, can be safe, and it looks like they've put the policies in place to affect that. They're vetting drivers, they're checking out driver histories, and then you're getting that user rating on the platform. So if you have a scary driver or somebody that just doesn't mesh well, the user rates them down and they're going to get kicked off that platform. So there's a couple of checks and balances within it that keep it accountable intrinsically. Um, again, my primary concern here is as a parent. And the research that I've done, I feel confident the industry has all the components in place to be accountable and safe, and I think we just need to create regulations that can accommodate it and keep it fair to where it's not pushing out our taxi drivers, but it's simply an alternate method of keeping our roads safe. 
David Bowden is next. No clapping, please. No, no, no. Uh, the reason we don't clap or boo or any of those other things is because it's got to feel like a safe place for a difference of opinions for everybody. So please honor that. And after David is Jeff White. Oh. Hi, I'm David Bowden, Eugene. I'm one of the owners of Eugene Hybrid Taxi. And I would just like to say that uh, I feel there is room here for Uber, but I think that they need to operate under the same rules and regulations that every other taxi company in the city does. They pick people up. They need to have the same rules. You know, we pick people up. There are regulations in effect to make sure that we have insurance. There are regulations in effect that make sure we have good cars that are in decent shape. They get checked twice a year to make sure that they're in good shape. I don't see that for Uber. Uh, their process, from what I've seen, is when you apply to be an Uber driver, they want to look at your car. They look at a car. And that's the car that they assume that you're going to be in. But when you have an app, you can drive any car. Maybe that was your friend's, maybe that was your wife's, maybe that was your husband's car. And maybe your car is an old, you know, 50 year old junker. We don't know. They don't have any way of telling. As far as the, the innovation of Uber, I, I think that having an app, that's a great idea. I would love to have you know, that kind of thing in the taxi industry so that we can pick people up faster. I like the idea of having on-demand drivers. I wish there was a way we could incorporate that into the, the way that all the taxi companies do work. And I, that, that's, uh, that's something that I think that would be a, a great thing for the rest of us to look into. They have a lot of great ideas and would be a, a great asset to Eugene if they follow our rules. You know, we, like I said, it's, it's the regulations. We all follow it. We all have the same <coughs> goal at the end of the night to make money and to get people home. It's a level playing field. It needs to be the same for everyone. We're all the same. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff White is next, followed by, looks like, Denise Guild. My name is Jeff White. Um, I'm one of the owners of Eugene Hybrid Taxi. And uh, we have an office here in Eugene, and I also live in Eugene. Um, again, just like my partner said, uh, we are, you know, welcome to any competition. We just want everybody to be playing on the same playing field, you know. And and my biggest thing is is you know the background checks and the insurance. I mean, you guys raised up our insurance last year to a million dollars. Well, there's a reason you did that. So everybody should have to have that same coverage. Um, Last year, uh, I had a lady call me up, and she wanted her 14-year-old to be picked up from the wow hall. And um, she asked me if I had any female drivers on, and, and I said I do. But I also wanted to reassure her that all taxi you know, drivers in the, in the city pass a background check, a thorough background check. And she had never known that, and she had never <clears> heard <throat> that before. And so, again, that's, that's my biggest concern is, is the public and you know, the, the reliability of the vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Denise Gill, followed by James Reed. Hey, my name's Denise Geld, and I've lived in Eugene for over 30 years. I started Budget Taxi in uh, 1984 uh, at a time when there was no regulation. <coughs> and we made our own. ID cards, took care of our own uh, inspections. It feels like we're going backwards. Uh, I, I do think there's room for uh, more taxis, but they have to be all going under the same rules. So if you decide that we don't have to mark our cars, and that we don't have to have inspections, that's for everybody, not just for these rogue cars that are going around Eugene, picking people up with uh, no control over their drivers, no control over the prices. And 
I think it should be fair for everybody. Love Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Reed is next, followed by Gary, uh, looks like Gillian. Uh, James Reed, uh, Ward 1. I'm here uh, as an advocate for the citizens who rely totally on public transportation. We have no options. We benefit greatly from all of them, from the Ride sharing is just another option. And there are many services, each of whom meets a portion of the needs that we have. Uh, medical transports, there's about 20 of them. Taxis, trains, LTD, ride source, Amtrak, long haul buses, pedicabs, shuttles, van pools, all of them. But the current discussion seems to focus on ride sharing versus taxis. And even though it's a generic issue, there seems to be arrows pointed at one particular company. And I think that's disingenuous by itself. Uh, taxis are great. I use them all the time. I, if I can still get rides after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they are great for just going across town. Or if I want to go from the Kiva market out to Walmart, I can do that. Uh, that's what taxis are for. The ride sharing services are totally different. They are not intended to operate by driving around town and having people hail them down or by uh, calling and saying, I want a five minute ride out here. They're for long distance, long haul services is the way I see them. And you know, ride sharing is that way. And part-time ad hoc drivers who may drive a couple of times a month are far different than people who are going to drive 20 times a day to go somewhere in terms of balancing the licenses and fees and all of that sort of thing. Uh, I always tell us, think of the story of if I want to go to Cresswell tonight and have dinner with some friends and go down there at 6 o'clock and come back at 11.30, there's no way to do that currently. Taxi company can't do it. There's no buses, trains, planes, or automobiles, essentially, that are going to be able to do something like that. And the ride sharing is a way to get that accomplished. And currently, there's about 20 ride sharing services in Eugene. One I belong to at the University of Oregon has 3,000 uh, members on the website. That's 1,500 drivers, since one's going to be a passenger, one's going to be a driver. They all charge something. It may be gas or gas and meals or whatever it is. But Thank they you. still have those issues. Thank you. Next up is Gary Gillian, followed by Ron Thompson. <coughs> Well, most of the people in this room don't remember when uh, you there was no regulation. Introduce yourself, oh, please. I'm Gary Gilland. I own the Airport City Taxi. Uh, I've been in business for nearly 30 years. When I started out, there was no regulations. Like Denise says, we ran with odometer, which is good odometer, good fare. We treat our customers good, so we built our business. Some of the companies didn't have that. They ran around with uh, an extra carburetor and a windshield just to uh, fix it when it broke. Mm -hmm. It was a zoo. The regulations came in in 91 and five of the companies disappeared the next day. Why? No insurance, no taxi meters, nothing. The regulations you put in place governed the cab business so it got it down to a safe and honorable business. You take the rules and change them now, you'll wind up taking it right back to where it was in 86, where there was no rules. Uh, me personally, before the regulations came in, I made a ton of money. I made enough money in five years to pay the down payment on my house. It's paid for. Now since then, I've worked hard, I've built my business, I'm due for retirement, I'm 66. 
Now, I don't want to see a business go down to tubes or go back to where it was back in 86. Now, you have the power to either keep it the way it is or change it. We introduced our meters within the first year we were in business. One reason, I wasn't the only driver. I had drivers that would charge one price today, one price tomorrow. Put the meter in the cab, there was no argument. The meter said what it was, and that's what they paid. The person that's sitting behind the driver can see that meter. They can read it. They know if they've been ripped off. And now we have regulations. They make a phone call. The city calls me. I can a driver. Simple process, easy to take care of. Uber, if they call Uber and complain, are they going to call the city and say, hey, they ripped me off? Well, I wouldn't if I was out of state. Why would I care? As somebody has been here for six generations, and I've seen this whole area grow, we don't need to step back into 86. If they don't want to comply with the city ordinances and the rules and regulations that govern it, then they don't need to be in business. Now, for me, if you go ahead and change the rules and let Ober run, Thank you. I'll join them. Thank you. Ron Thompson is next, followed by Ethan Holub. Hello, my name is Ron Thompson, and I'm a, a citizen of Springfield, an active member in Eugene area politics. Um, with what I want to focus on here is the the idea that we are in the process of formalizing informal markets. Uh, we're in the era of Airbnb. We're in the era era of of this new uh, legalization process with marijuana. We're in the, the era of, of digital information and technology that allows mass markets to be accessed uh, daily uh, around the world and uh, big data which allows us to produ produce efficiencies that haven't been available before. So what I see Uber doing and in some cases very poorly, <laughs> is trying to butt into existing marketplaces. Uh, and of course, their, their whole goal is to uh, create disruption. But that doesn't mean that the ideas behind them are flawed. The implementation of Uber is probably flawed, and it's probably obnoxious. However, that there are now more and more choices on those marketplaces that are not acting in those ways. So by providing proper, proper ordinances to allow the rules for existing businesses and for future businesses to operate efficiently and effectively together in a marketplace, I think that change does need to come. I do also believe that knowing who our operators are is important. I also believe that knowing who the that people are following Oregon laws in all aspects, including insurance and other issues, are important. So crafting these new ordinances is what is most important and will provide the best opportunities for a smooth transition from, from a more uh, non-technologically advanced portion of society to one that integrates all across the board and allows the most efficient and effective uh, business opportunities and consumer opportunities for Eugene Springfield. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ethan Holub, followed by Charles Hare. Hello, my name is Ethan Holub, and I live in Eugene. I live in the Whitaker neighborhood. I am an owner-operator with Oregon Taxi. I own 12 taxis. And there's, man, there's a long list of, of things I could talk about, but I just kind of want to hit three of the points would be, first off, any company or person that has no regard for the law. Um, first off, I don't believe this is ride-sharing at all. I've traveled around the world. I've seen ride-sharing. This is illegal, an illegal transportation business. 
nationwide, they've just paid fines and chosen not to have any regard for the law. Um, places like in Australia, they were known for paying people, charging people $400 to get away from the terrorist attack that was going on in New York and Chicago. Multiple people during rush hours normally pay $40, pay up to $300 just to get home because it's busy. And then I was just in New York about three weeks ago, and one of the one of the buzzes with the, just talking to the taxi drivers is Uber is known for the place where you get your women or your drugs because the drug dealers and the sex traffickers now can put some on the street. And I'm not saying that to put fear or to say that'll happen here. I'm just saying that the fact that there's a company that has no regulations and no accountability is is not okay with me as a citizen and, and, and it's the people who make the laws. The second aspect for me would be. Um, the drivers, my drivers, um, since Uber's been on the streets here, we, I've personally lost six drivers that couldn't make it. Um, a lot of my drivers are barely scratching by every day because the, the market's just been flooded. These are men and women who have paid all the fees to become legally taxi drivers. They've had background checks. They pay a yearly fee. They pay the startup fee. And now they're just being um, ran out of business and made unemployed by by companies that just ignore all those fees. Mm -hmm. And um, my, and me personally, I spend um, tens of thousands of dollars a year upkeeping my vehicles to what the city codes are, paying all the fees and everything, paying the vehicles, like was said earlier. And I, I agree that if, uh, if it should be one or the other, there can't be a company that exists that doesn't have to do it when the rest of us do have to do it because that's our money, that's our drivers, that's hundreds of drivers we have that um, could become un unemployed, and I also believe um, if you look at the numbers, that a lot of the smaller taxi businesses could probably go under if, if they're just let to run free, if, if the legal companies are let to run free. I know it would affect our business big time, and it's already put a lot of people unemployed. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Charles Hare, followed by Bruce Orton. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Charles Hare. I live in Eugene, resident of Lord Byron Place. I'm a co-owner of Oregon Taxi. Let's please not get lost in the technology of Uber. Oregon Taxi has an app coming out currently that affords, that affords every single technological, technological advance that Uber is currently using. Our company is locally owned and operated and consists of a fleet of 51 vehicles, 20 employees, 15 owner operators, and some 150 professional drivers. We've been serving the cities of Eugene and Springfield since 2004. Our company works hard to serve the public good, complying with all ordinances designed to provide safe, reliable, and affordable transportation services to the entire local community, including students, the elderly, the poor, and disabled, whenever and wherever they are needed at fair and regulated prices. <clears throat> Over the past 10 years, Oregon Taxi has grown to be the largest provider of taxi services in Eugene Springfield, and we are proud of the leadership role that we have taken in the community and the innovations that we have introduced. Last year, local taxi company operators, including Oregon Taxi, formed the Eugene Safe Taxi Coalition. Its 11 member companies represent 97% of all legally licensed taxis in the Eugene Springfield streets. Coalition members share your concern for safety of the Eugene Springfield taxi passengers and have made safety, security, and dependability our top priorities. We appreciate the city's attention to these matters and efforts to update the PPV ordinances while calling for compliance by all transportation providers. Some of our members are here tonight, employees and family. I'd like to ask them to stand for a moment. Thank you all very much. The coalition would like to thank you and the city for all your efforts to control the presence of unlicensed and illegal transportation providers in the community. However, we are concerned to see such drivers continuing to operate on our streets. It appears that their business practices are not only continuing but growing. Uber has two recruitment seminars in Eugene later this week. We are supportive of the proposed amendments to update all ordinances and reflect advancements <clears throat> in technology, but only when the enforcement that must accompany them in order for the city to maintain the level playing field critical for a healthy taxi industry. We have seen in other communities around the country and the world, fines levied against a company valued at $41 billion are just not effective. 
To our view, the only successful method for keeping such rogue taxi uh, service providers off the streets is enforcement in our streets. We appreciate the city's announcement last week on plans for such actions and ask that the implementation of these plans be executed immediately without delay. Mayor Piercy, city councilors and staff, as you consider the proposed PPV ordinance amendments on behalf of all of our members, employees, drivers, we ask that you also take into account the need for robust enforcement requires to ensure compliance. Please remember, this discussion is not about technology. It's about the law, the laws that many in this room have abided for many years. There's no reason to get lost in the minutia. Thank, Thank you. you. Bruce Orton is next, followed by Peter Pryor. Hi, I'm Bruce Orton. I'm a Eugene resident. I previously owned two taxi companies, a shuttle bus line and a tour company in Alaska where they actually have weather. Uh, Uber is basically an investment balloon. It's got deep pockets temporarily. It's run by immature characters in Silicon Valley without respect for anyone, including women working in their headquarters. Much of the investments have been pocketed already by those people, and they're throwing a lot of the rest at local situations in hope of destroying resistance quickly. This is capitalism at its worst. Uber capriciously disregards local laws worldwide that have grown organically to deal in local situations. They seek to destroy local control and do whatever they want. For example, Sydney, Australia. When one nut in a chocolate shop was downtown, they raised their rates 400%. And they already had your credit card number if you had ridden Uber before. You get in that car, boom. You have no idea, no regulation whatsoever. They don't get the licensing necessary anywhere and thumb their noses at government. Rapes and crimes are proliferating wherever Uber is temporarily dominant. Uber vehicles are not regularly inspected by local authorities and not even identifiable. In a year or so, they'll be beside Enron, Lehman Brothers, Charles Ponzi, and Bernie Madoff in the annals of ripoffs. And any municipality that goes along with it will be picking up the pieces through lawsuits and chaos. It's set to destroy the relationship between businesses and local governments and it cause incredible problems in municipal government and will be an example of capitalism gone berserk for future generations. It's like internet gypsy cab. You have no control whatsoever. Options, don't be passive aggressive. Raise fines, big fines. If Uber wants to pay them, great. It goes in your budget. Hooray, take it. Other, and besides that, Go for the driving privileges of the drivers. They can do nothing about that. You'll be a great example of a city standing up to something that won't even be around in a year or two. I pretty much guarantee that. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Peter Pryor, followed by, and I may be reading this wrong, it's the best I can do, Jay Mayernick. Hi, my name is Peter Pryor. Um, I'm a student at the University of Oregon. Thanks for hearing me tonight. Um, I just want to speak on behalf of Uber. I think that um, it is perfectly safe for a lot of the riders that are using it. Also, I think that it is um, fostering relationships with businesses in the community. And also, I feel that um, I think that also there should be a level playing field, and I in no way intend by my support to hurt anyone's business. But I think that competition and compromise are kind of what um, businesses uh, founded on, and I think that us playing by or Uber playing at a level playing field would obviously allow them to operate here, and I think that it would help uh, be another alternative for transportation for anyone, a student, a parent, a family, and also help to stop DUIs in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jamie Ernick, followed by Richard Acosta. Probably got it all wrong, but you'll clear that up. <laughs> no, you got it right. Okay. Oh, very good. Hi, my name is Jay Marinick. Uh, I'm a resident of 2676 Atticus Way, Eugene, and I'm the general manager of Oregon Taxi. Uh, I'm concerned by the presence of unlicensed and illegal drivers continuing to operate without city approval on local streets. I'm troubled by the unnecessary and unreasonable unre risk this situation poses to the continued availability of safe, reliable, affordable transportation services for the entire Eugene Springfield community. I appreciate the city's attention to this matter and your efforts to update the PPV ordinance while calling for compliance by all transportation providers. Um, just to echo what the gentleman from uh, airport 
said about compliance. I mean, there's a city employee dedicated to PPV compliance. And, you know, if one of our vehicles gets a complaint from a customer, if it's unsafe, if it has a dent in it or anything like that, she calls me right away and, and we take care of it. Um, th that's what compliance does. I mean, with these illegal uh, apps, who's who, who are they going to call? Right? Um, I support the city's proposed amendments to update the taxi ordinance to reflect the use of smartphones, but only if the city also moves to enforce the, this and existing ordinances that provide uh, for public safety. Um, for our part, we've developed our own app, as Chuck said. I mean, you could download it right now. You could hail a cab with the push of a button. Um, you know, the point is that technology isn't exclusive to these uh, illegal transportation companies. Um, you know, we provide similar technology within the scope of existing regulation. Uh, Mayor Piercy, city councilors and staff, as you consider the PPV ordinance amendments, I ask you to also enforce the city's taxi rules uh, to continue to protect the traveling public. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Richard Acosta is next, followed by Eric Groomer. Hi, good evening. I'm Ricardo Acosta, and uh, I'm a student of the University of Oregon. Uh, and I just wanted to say uh, I've been in the school enrolled for longer than three years, and I personally think it's Uber is more useful than local taxi services because I can get a taxi immediately and not have to wait two hours to get a taxi. And I know people are angry about this, but I just feel that's just the way it is. Uber provides a better service for me, for me to get faster to my home and do my homework or whatever than have to wait two hours to do so. And I feel in general like people are mad because not just me, a lot of my um, fellow students at university, we believe that the taxi service are lacking their job. They take way too long to get there and the rates are really expensive, especially us because we are on a budget. So I say like if the taxi services want not Uber to be there, they should be, well, more reasonable and cheaper, because that's why we take Uber in the first place. And I also, I unfortunately got a DUI a couple of years back, and it's easier for me to take an Uber and not get in any more trouble and not risk any lives any time I go out. And I feel many college students do the same thing, so I think it's easier for everybody just to accept that Uber is a good solution, as well as the taxi services, but yeah, that's pretty much just all I wanted to say. Thank you. Next is Eric Groomer, followed by Charles Hibbard. My name is Eric Groomer. I'm a resident in Eugene. And I'm also a owner with Oregon Taxi, so I have a vested interest. Um, I think it's interesting, this modern marriage of technology with ride sharing. I'm not naive enough to think that it's not here to stay, but I think that we are too easily enamored of that marriage, of the use of the technology and the bling. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have traveled a bit, and coming back to the United States, I'm aware of some of the benefits we have being first world members. Uh, that I can walk down the street when it rains in Eugene and not be afraid of being electrocuted as I walk through a puddle, or when I drink a glass of water that it's safe to consume. There's a lot of things that are transparent to me. A lot of consideration, a lot of planning, a lot of regulation into the safety of me as a resident in Eugene. And I'm thankful for that, having been places where you can't assume those things. But I feel like we're entering into a new area here where it's new, it hasn't been regulated. I think, personally, to the extent that it needs to be. And when we're talking about a matter of public transportation, that's also, it becomes a matter of public safety, which by extension means a matter of public regulation. And so I do encourage you to uh, take seriously the amendments to these PPV ordinances. I'm not sure that it's going far enough. I don't have a lot of respect for a company that 
is uh, told not to operate in a country in Europe, and they say we will continue to operate and we'll see you in court. And I don't have a lot of respect for them coming into the city where I live with basically a can opener and a crowbar, and they're still operating. But that's just my personal opinion. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Charles Hibbert is next, followed by Brooke Steger. Um, I'm Charles Hibbert. I've got a business down here in Eugene, Oregon. I do a lot of traveling all over the world. I've been to Belgium. I've been all over the United States. There was a time I used to travel across out of, out of Eugene Airport about three times a week. Um, and I think this Uber is a very good idea. In 1980, early 1980s, I used to own a video store. And we actually used to have to keep thousands and thousands of these in stock and pay video companies uh, the movie suppliers commissions and that for renting out videos. And people used to come to my store and have to rent a big machine and take it with them home and watch the video. Uh, the technology has advanced that today you just sit in your seat in your, at your house and you can get videos downloaded. And you look around, you see hardly any videos, video stores uh, um, in existence anymore. It's the same as this taxi service. We're looking at old antiquated systems that you're trying to protect with government regulation and they can't compete because they're so regulated. People in Uber, I travel, I've had the most horrible experiences in the taxi service. In Miami one day I got a guy that couldn't even speak a word of English. He took me down to Miami instead of Fort Lauderdale before I made him pull over the gas station uh, to find out where the hell he, had, he was supposed to go and he, we were about 20 miles off track. I've come into Eugene yeah, and you get into a police car that's done about 500,000 miles, the door handles are busted, the cars are horrible. And if I get an Uber guy, the guy pulls up in a 4 series BMW or a pretty nice car. And if it's the new world we live in and there is a place for Uber. It sounds to me like the taxi industry is just over-regulated to the degree that they can't compete. So I think that you've got to announce the new technology, you've got to look at why you're making the old technology uncompetitive because there is a place for all of them but to try and put the new technology out of business just because you're trying to protect the old taxi service industry because your rules and regulations are so stringent and expensive it's very difficult for me to, to for me to listen to business people asking for more regulation is pretty scary that's almost un-american you know that's all i have to say Brooks Steger is next, followed by, I think it's uh, Rod Menorick. Hi, my name is Brooks Steger. I'm the general manager of Uber here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I want to thank you guys for looking into the TNC issue. We are 100% in support of regulations that focus on safety. As we've seen throughout the country, there are regulations being defined and TNCs, transportation network companies, are being put in a separate bucket than taxis, than buses, than pedicabs, um, than limousine services. So we would like to see regulations put in place here in Eugene that support safety, that support TNCs, and that understand that there are fundamental differences in the business models between the varying services and transportation options. We see ourselves as an addition to the transportation network in an existing city. Um, in Seattle, for example, over 60% of the UberX trips taken in Seattle are rep replacing personal vehicle trips. They're not replacing taxi trips. They're not replacing bus trips. We're seeing more and more people leave their personal vehicles at home as rides and affordable rides become extremely accessible to them. We're also 100%, as I said, in support of safety regulations. We currently carry $1 million of combined single limit primary liability coverage including underinsured and uninsured motorist coverage during the time of commercial activity. We also do 19-point vehicle inspections with licensed mechanics locally here in Eugene for every vehicle. Those are done on an annual basis, and those are done prior to those vehicles coming onto the system. We also run full 50 state FBI um, state, county, city level background checks. Those are done on an annual basis. Um, that also includes a driving record check and a sex offender check. So I think we are putting regulate or we are putting practices in place um, to support safety and to promote the safety of the people here in Eugene. And we want to see regulations put into place that support those. 
um, that support the part-time driver driving their personal vehicle that is held to the same safety standards, but also supports the fact that they may be a single mom driving for three or four hours a week. They might be driving full-time one week and then none at all the following week because they're a student. Um, we also want to support a system here that reduces DUIs. I think going to Lane Community College here, that's, that was a big problem. Um, and we want to see that reduction come to Eugene. There was over 20,000 DUIs in the state of Oregon last year. We want to be a part of reducing that and focusing on that and focusing purely on safety. So we ask you to visit regulations that focus on TNCs as a separate service, but as part of the greater transportation network here in Eugene. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Rod Minerick, followed by Tom Alberti. I'm Rod Minerick. I drove for Oregon Taxi for off and on 12 years. I know what it's all like. Um, I'm driving Uber. I um, live here in Eugene, Oregon, and um, I want to speak for the people that ride with me. Um, they love Uber. They love it because it's convenient. We're there quickly. It's a clean car, and um, the drivers are happy. Um, all I can say is that uh, you, we need to find a way to regulate uh, Uber to stay here because uh, without it, I think we're going to have a lot of uh, disappointed college students. Most of the people from out of town, Arizona, San Francisco, Los Angeles, it's all Uber <coughs> down there. So um, there's room for everybody, and so that's what I want to say today. Thank you. Um, Alberti's next, followed by Brenda Laird. Hi, my name is Tom Salberti. I live at 30 Monroe in the Whitaker. Go with. Um, I'd like to thank you all, first of all, for the opportunity to speak, and I'd like to thank all the speakers that spoke for and against the, uh, the new regulations. I'd like to speak in favor of the new regulations, and, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a certain amount of trust uh, that that goes with the taxi industry. Um, the uh, the 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 fares, our customers, um, um, trust us to to provide a service in a in a timely manner, and uh, I believe we can all do that. And uh, and it's important that we um, that we we consider all the. Uh, the, the ramifications. I've been a taxi driver for uh, 30 years in, in several different states, and um, and there, there's uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I don't like public speaking. Um, uh, you know, I, I I own some taxis, and I see my my drivers every. Every at the beginning of every shift, at the end of every shift, I know their mental states. And an Uber driver, from my understanding, is just out there. Um, uh, there's no, there's no credit. There's, there's no. They don't see. There's no management manager to see them to 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 check on their conditions, their 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 health, their mental health, their how they're dealing with the stress of of driving a. A vehicle and driving people around, um, and I think uh, uh, that that's a concern that, that could be addressed in the in the new regulations. Um, some way to 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 for for the city to regulate the drivers themselves to make sure that they're up to par. That, that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Brenda Laird is next, followed by Dale Wing. Hi, my name is Brenda Laird, and I live in West Eugene. Uber has benefited me in so many ways. My car is out of repo status. I get to set my own hours and days that I work. Just having my own business is exciting. A few weeks with Uber, and we got our cars inspected. Uber riders feel safe knowing that they are covered by Uber insurance. Uber riders like knowing how far away we are. Uber riders love the split fare option. They're, they get their fare quote before the ride, cashless transactions, and fingertip app to get a ride. Reasonable rates keep drunk college kids off the road. 
I did 30 rides Halloween night. That's 30 drunk kids not driving. Thank you. Thank you. Gail Wing is next, followed by Thomas Pettisar. Hello, my name is Dale Wing. I'm a resident here in Eugene. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Uber has been such a godsend to myself financially and my family. It, it, uh, it's been wonderful, absolutely wonderful to me. Um, it's given me the opportunity to have my own business and to set my own hours and to be flexible as I can be for my family and myself and, and my Uber drivers. It, uh, Uber has been first rate in supporting drivers in any way they can. There's been a lot of misconceptions here tonight. Um, we are, we do have to have our cards inspected. We do have background checks where they check our criminal background checks. They go through all of our situations. They've been so supportive to us in any way they can, in any way they, we ask. They've been wonderful to us. Um, thank you much for the opportunity to speak to me. Thank you. Thomas Pettisar is next, followed by Josh Silverman. Hi, Thomas Pettisar, uh, resident of Eugene. Uh, I also own a business downtown called The Barn Light, of which uh, bar service is a component. Um, and quite simply, I support uh, any effort that results in an increase uh, of options and opportunities for safe transportation. Um, there is a huge demand for safe transportation every week in downtown. Um, and as some previous speakers mentioned, that often results in very lengthy wait times for, for passengers. Um, and I shudder at the thought that uh, some folks become impatient waiting for a taxi and decide uh, to drive themselves after drinking. Um, and as such, uh, uh, if if amending the code uh, supports uh, uh, operators like Uber and others to satisfy this, this demand for safe tra transportation, uh, then I think it's, it's an absolutely great idea. Thank you very much for your time. Josh Silverman is next, followed by Mike Charlton, it looks like. I'm going to pass my, my, my thoughts a bit into this. Is, this, uh, is that Josh? Yeah is a pass. Mike Charlton? Example. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Josh. My name is Mike Charlton. I'm a Eugene resident. I live over on McLean Boulevard. I want to make three very quick points in support of Uber. I've used them a lot. I travel a lot in my business. I've always found their drivers to be incredibly cordial, incredibly helpful, incredibly professional. I've never been disappointed in an Uber ride. Anytime I was confronted with surge pricing, which you've heard something about, I was always given plenty of notice in advance. If I didn't want to take the surge pricing, if I didn't want to pay the extra rates, I didn't have to. I'd find some other way to, to go or get to my destination. It was always a voluntary transaction. I've always felt like that the, these cars were very well maintained, they were very clean, they were very modern, and it was a very pleasurable experience. When I got to my destination, the financial transaction was done, I got out of the car and I went about my business. I got a receipt, driver got his fare, usually a tip with it, and everybody was happy. It was very quick and very painless and a great experience. The other thing about it is, as you've already heard, is that creating more options for this kinds of public transportation increases the pool of people who are going to use public transportation. In every city that I've been in, the presence of a service like Uber has created a much greater demand so that there's more than enough business for everybody depending on what kind of transaction and what kind of service that they wanted to use. And I want to conclude with one final observation because you've heard a lot about the downtown and the central business district. I agree with that. All the arguments have been made. But consider your airport. It's now with the increased ridership on planes coming in and out of Eugene, it's almost impossible to find a parking place at your local airport. So that when you go to the airport, you almost have to use some sort of public transportation. This is just yet another market where a service like Uber can provide a very valuable, financially successful service 
for citizens in the city to access the airport. I urge you to adopt a system of regulation that encourages services like Uber to participate in this whole process. I think it's 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 a great benefit for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Ned Christensen is next, followed by it looks like Sandeep Kinney. Good evening. I'm Ned Christensen. I live in the South Hills of Eugene, and I also live in Seattle. We have two residences. I have a business in Seattle. And I've used taxis a lot, and I've used Uber a lot. So I think I, I'm in a good position to be able to compare them. There is no comparison. I love Uber. I've never waited longer than eight minutes, and it's usually like five minutes. And I can watch them on the GPS as they arrive. And my condo in Seattle is about 25 miles from downtown. A taxi fare is between 60 and $70. I've done it many times. The Uber fare is between 35 and 45. I've never had a, a car that wasn't in perfect, pristine condition from Uber. Yeah, in Eugene, I take taxis because often I can't, I don't have a choice to take Uber here. The last four times I've taken a taxi in, in Eugene, the one of the windows wouldn't roll up in the back, and so I got blown the entire trip to the train station. Another time, the, in fact, the most recent time, the seat belt wouldn't, wouldn't latch. Another time, I got to sit at a 45-degree angle in the cab because the seat was broken. That would never happen in Uber. It's time for us to take a look at this and say this is a new technology. It's a new day. I'm sure people kicked and screamed too when we went from horse and buggies to cars. It's a new day. It's a time to take another look at this because I can tell you as a user there's no comparison. Sandeep Keeney, followed by Jeremy Tucci. Hi, I'm Sandeep Kinney. Uh, I'm an operations manager for Uber, uh, specific uh, to Eugene and the Pacific Northwest. First of all, I want to just thank you for allowing me to speak today and bring this issue uh, to the public hearing. Over the past six months, I've had the great opportunity to speak with lo lots of riders and uh, our driver partners in Eugene. Riders love the uh, reliability and ease of use of the application. For those of you who haven't used it, within like two taps of a uh, a button on your app, you can have a ride coming to you, typically within seven minutes or less. You can see it on the map. You can see a picture of the driver. You can see the driver's name. Uh, you can see a picture of the vehicle. And we can also see the vehicle license plate. And that enables a very safe ride. You know who you're getting, uh, which car you're getting into and who you're going to see. In addition, riders have the benefit of knowing that we do rigorous background checks on our partners, that we have a commercial uh, policy insurance, as Brooke mentioned, and that we require annual vehicle inspections. So one of the things that I think we do great is we solicit a lot of feedback as well. After every ride on a receipt, we get a, in like a, like kind of like a big little link to submit your feedback, and we get lots of feedback. If there's something wrong with your car, if you think the rider took the uh, driver took the wrong route, you can write it in, and we'll be happy to help you out. As uh, typically within just a few hours. If there is something wrong with the vehicle, we'll take the vehicle off the system until we can confirm that it's been fixed. I think one of the, uh, the other things you've heard from our driver partners is that you get to own your own business. It's very flexible. You get to work whenever you want, and you have the opportunity to work as much or as little, or not as much. We <laughs> want to make sure everyone's staying safe. But you get to basically own your own business and uh, help yourself grow, uh, whether it's just a few hours a week or 40 hours a week. As Brooke mentioned, there are fundamental differences between uh, TNCs and traditional taxis. Given the great positive experiences that both riders and our driver partners are seeing, we ask that you embrace, use regulations that embrace this new technology like other cities uh, in the United States have done, and uh, continue to support uh, new technologies such as Uber and other TNCs. Jeremy Tucci is next. Followed by Riley, it looks like Turhar. Hello, thank you for letting us all speak. Uh, most of my issues have been mentioned about 10 or 15 times, so I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to mention a New York Times. Did Time, you introduce yourself? Jeremy Tusi. Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry. I just wanted to mention a uh, December 9th New York Times article uh, states two California district attorneys filed a civil suit 
Tuesday against Uber, uh, charging that the company misled consumers about the methods it uses to screen its drivers. Uh, the suit was filed by the San Francisco and Los Angeles counties. Uh, it says that Uber mischaracterizes the extent to which it vets its drivers and demands that startups immediately cease violating California law. Um, Uber does not go above and beyond local requirements in every city in which it operates, George Gasson, the district attorney of San Francisco, said at a news conference. It does not uh, require fingerprints for a background check, uh, which California and Oregon requires, um, which is the most comprehensive form of driver screaming methodology. Um, I also have used Uber, and I have to say that there is no difference between an, any taxi company I've ever used throughout the country and Uber. There's no difference. They are not a ride-sharing company. They are a taxi company and should be held to the same laws as the rest of us. Uh, there is one difference I've noticed. Uh, Uber, if you are can't afford a credit card, you are unable to use Uber. Uh, I kind of feel like that's a, uh, kind of a dig on people that can't afford a credit card. Um, Anyway, thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate mm -hmm. you guys listening to us all. Thank, thank you. you. Riley Turhar, uh, and then followed up is Ed McClone. There. Riley? Oh, sorry. Okay. Put me in a queue for when we speak. <clears throat> um, hi, my name is Riley. <clears throat> My name is Riley Terhar. I'm a student at University of Oregon. I came here today, uh, first and foremost, to kind of speak on behalf of Uber, as both as a, a user and just kind of a big fan of what they have to offer. Um, first and foremost, they're a business, and what a business does is obviously attempt to sustain profitability. And I think the way they've done that is just kind of frightening to taxi companies that have been here before. Um, I see a lot of the complainants here against them being from taxi companies and probably because they found a more efficient system that gets people home safe, that gets drunk kids, uh, keeps them off the roads. I have a number of peers that have uh, uh, been drunk drivers or been victims of drunk drivers and this app, if you step out of a bar and you click on your phone app, within five minutes someone's coming to pick you up. Um, as you've heard, they do background checks, their cars are checked, um, it's safe. You see who's coming to get you. They're rated. If someone before has not liked that driver, they can give them a one or no star rating, and you don't have to get picked up by that person. You can choose a different Uber driver to come get you. Um, that's just one of the ways that they can prevent and uh, drunk driving and keep this community safer. Um, it helps local businesses because if a kid wants to get uh, to and from a bar and it's raining or if someone wants to go to and from a restaurant or something like that and they don't want to wait 30 minutes in the rain uh, for a cab, they can get a, an Uber within two minutes. And it's great that Oregon Taxi is uh, stepping up and getting the technology that Uber has built its platform on. They're getting um, an app, but that's not going to solve their problem. I can maybe hail a, a cab on their app, but it's still going to take it 30 to 45 minutes to come pick me up as opposed to Uber being readily available. And um, it's just a safe and convenient way for people to travel. And I think it, um, you guys need to visit uh, regulations that treats it not as a cab, but as a cab alternative, as a TNC, like people have been saying. And I think it could be great for this community. Thank you. Last stop, Edward McClellan. Hi there, Edward McLone representing Lane Transit District. It is my dubious honor to be the final speaker and save you all from <laughs> hearing any more. Uh, just here to let you know about a couple of pieces of interest that LTD has in the Uber regulation. Uh, we're an agency with a vested interest in transportation in our community and there are kind of two specific areas of our business that make us interested in this conversation and ask to be partners with you as uh, you consider further regulation of these entities. Uh, the first thing is that as 
as part of a transportation district that provides public transit, our goal is to create an, an ecosystem of transportation options that makes it possible for people to get around without driving a personal single occupancy vehicle. From that side of our service, we have great interest in the opportunity that Uber and other transportation network companies provide as a service that makes it easier for people who choose to live without cars or don't have the ability to access them uh, to get around more easily. Unfortunately, we don't have the funding we need to provide 24-hour service all the time, and even still, the bus isn't always the best option for everyone. Uh, on the other side of things, through our RideSource paratransit service, which provides service for people with disabilities or other issues that make it impossible for them to ride the bus, uh, we are required to provide door-to-door -door transportation to them while our service is in operation. Uh, additionally, through Medicaid, we are the non-emergency medical transportation broker uh, that provides transportation rides for people to get to and from medical appointments if they don't have their own transportation. Both of those services are heavily regulated by who we can and cannot contract with by the federal and state government, and we are pretty much limited to work with ourselves, uh, ambulance or other kind of uh, ambulatory vans, uh, and taxi companies. Uber, unfortunately, does not meet those needs, and so as there has been, in some cities, instances of harm to the taxi industry, uh, and we really tax their ability to meet demand at times, we have a vested interest in making sure that whatever kind of transportation fee for higher services exist in our community are able to exist without destroying opportunities for folks with uh, medical needs to get around. Uh, so, you know, we've had long conversations with Uber about this. We're excited by the fact that it appears in some cities they're introducing vehicles that have accessibility options for people with mobility devices. Uh, but we ask that as you kind of look at these regulations, you think about the additional transportation <clears throat> services that exist beyond uh, what I think we tend to think of taxis or other for higher transportation services to be for. Uh, and we'd like to offer ourselves up as a resource to talk further about that uh, and work closely with you and city staff as you develop further regulations on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm going to thank you all. <coughs> Everybody was extremely polite and well-spoken, and I appreciate it. Uh, lots of things to think about. I've got uh, Councillor Clark and then Councillor Polling in the queue and Councillor Zelenka and Councillor Pryor. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate everyone being here this evening. I appreciate all the opinions and all of the thoughts while we consider this particular piece of legislation and the kind of the future of how we deal with this in the community. Uh, I have to say that from my perspective, representing people from Ward 5, I approach this now today in a very similar way that I have all along, that I believe our appropriate role is to make sure, number one, that the public is safe, and number two, that in the area of people being paid to provide rides and transportation to other people, our job is to make sure that we deal with this with a level playing field, that everybody gets treated equally before the law. And I, I think that's the, the, ver the very most basic thing we should s place we should start from. I also want to say that I appreciate the folks from uh, the management of Uber from, for being here. I appreciated hearing your thoughts and concerns. I think it makes it very convenient for after this public hearing gets over, I'm glad you're here for the opportunity for you to sit with the city manager and staff and, and make agreement with the city for paying the $118,000 you owe us. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay then, Councillor Poling. Thank you. Um, you know, this isn't about, to me, the, the discussion is not about the quality of service provided by any of the taxi companies or by Uber. It's about fairness. It's about leveling the playing field by following the rules and the regulations. And the way I see it, the some of the, the, the added worded to this ordinance is kind of balancing out what the new technology is doing for the the industry and you know it's it, it just boils down to to me is one simple argument and that's fairness we want to make sure that every company in this community whether it be uh, uh, paying for rides or, or uh, selling goods or whatever it is, but whatever that industry or that company is, 
plays by the rules that all the other companies that does the same service has to go by. And we've got those established. That we are changing some of the rules to keep, try to catch up with the technology. I myself am kind of technically challenged, but I'm glad that we are moving forward to, to include some of these new technologies. And the, the fairness issue, a, a good example of the fairness issue is every time one of our existing taxis go out to the airport, they have to pay a fee. That's not fair to them if other companies that aren't licensed by the city can go out there and not have to pay that fee. And I, and I don't know what that fee is. It could be a dollar. It could be a hundred dollars. Who, who knows? Who cares? The fact is that it's <coughs> being applied to certain companies that follow the rules and the regulations. And the ones that choose not to don't have to worry about it. And that's not right. So I, I'm I, I like some of the additions that are into the into the proposed wording. Um, I think we need to have a further discussion on perhaps the way we go about enforcing and the, the regulations and also the the, the, the uh, penalty structure of the regulation also. Councilor Zelenka? Yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out this evening, hearing all the comments and the perspectives. It was pretty much about even, actually, in terms of numbers. Uh, I think we're entering into a new era with different players, with different technology, entering an established marketplace, and how do we do that? This is a question before us, and how do we integrate Uber and ride sharing and TNCs into what we already are doing? I want to increase competition. I want to increase choice and options. I want to increase convenience. I want to take advantage of new technology. And so how do we do that and ensure public safety, create a level playing field, and protect the public from um, price gouging. And a lot of people depend on this service who can't afford, whether it be TNC or taxi cabs, they can't afford cars or cannot physically drive. So it's important that they get looked out for. Uh, taxi companies are small businesses and they work hard. You guys have uh, shown that clearly tonight. Uber is a gigantic $40 billion multinational corporation, very deep pockets. But the people that drive the Uber cars are small business owners or individuals, and, and they work hard too. Um, when, when people in Eugene get in a taxi or, a, or a, a ride share car, they should feel safe and not worried about getting taken for a ride, so to speak. <laughs> so that means that they need to have this the companies that do this service need to have the same background check on drivers, they need to have the same inspections, they need to have the same regulations and, and licenses, they need the same level of insurance coverage, and they need to charge fair fares. And so our job is to create a level playing field and then let people compete. I'm pretty confident that Uber and, and TNCs and taxis can coexist under the same rules, so that's where I'm heading with this uh, regulation and this uh, ordinance. Councilor Fryer. Um, thank you. I really also appreciate the folks who came out and spoke. Very, very helpful information. Um, just speaking for me in terms of how I see my role as um, a city councilor is I'm really not interested in regula regulating competition. Uh, that's not an area that we should be engaged in. I'm also not thinking we should be resisting progress or new technologies. That's also not our job. New technologies, ways of things that are changing, we should actually embrace and figure out how to incorporate. Um, I don't think it's our job to deal with the owners of companies who may be jerks. Um, if we did that, we'd never get anything done because there's way too many companies with jerks that are directors that we could get <laughs> caught up with. But I am extremely committed that this council should deal with issues of safety. Um, whether it's safety for drivers, safety for vehicles, or safety, most of all, for passengers. And what will it take to get there? Um, why is it being so hard for us to get there? Um, I know that the city wants to talk to Uber and work this out. And from what I understand, Uber wants to talk to the city and work this out. Well, why can't we make that work? Um, a lot of folks talk about fairness. I think we want to get to fairness, but how do we do get to fairness? Does that require us to deregulate the taxi business or regulate 
the, the, the ride share business or find some hybrid in between. I think the conversation between Uber and the city in order to reach that would be meaningful for us. And I'm not understanding why that conversation is not happening in a more effective way. Um, we've now got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fines going um, because that conversation isn't happening. And I, and I'm wondering why we can't make that happen. If we're concerned with safety, and I believe that the taxi industry is concerned with safety, and I believe that Uber is concerned with safety, and the city is concerned with safety, if we all three have that interest in common, then we should be able to work this out unless there is something else at play that I'm not aware of. And I don't think there should be. So I would like for us to not have to stand in the way of progress. I don't want to regulate competition. I do want to ensure safety. And I plead with all the players to come back to the table and figure out a way to make this work, because I think it can. Councilor Sagret. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, everyone who spoke. It's very enlightening and uh, great to hear from all points of view. Um, to some of the folks in the taxi industry who pleaded with us to enforce the rules, I think if you read the paper, you will see we are enforcing our rules in the, the mechanisms that we have to do that, and Uber continues to flout them. Uh, so, you know, we have limited options to hold them accountable at this point. And um, for those of you who testified that you've had bad experiences in our local cab companies, you now know that the city has a dedicated person who can take your complaint and pass that on to the local taxi company who will need to fix it. Otherwise, they will uh, risk losing their license. So they really have something at stake under the current regime. Um, it's great to hear that Uber has policies in place to check vehicles and conduct background checks, but that doesn't exempt them from complying with our local laws. They can change their internal policies at any time. How do we have confidence in what those uh, policies actually result in in terms of um, safety for the public? So. As my fellow counselors have said, I'm all for embracing new technology. I agree that it needs to be part of our local business, and competition is healthy and positive. But for me, the way Uber has decided to not follow the law and keep operating makes it very hard to take their assurances for caring about public safety and the public in general very seriously, since our regulations are in effect in order to protect the public. And by continuing to recruit drivers here in Eugene, Uber is actually encouraging others to violate city law. And that is very problematic <clears throat> and unfair to our businesses who are operating within the law. So I think you've heard from the other councilors who spoke that this council wants to continue to protect the public while finding a role for new technology and operations to uh, fit into it. But it's got to be within the law. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. We're going to move on to the next. May yes, I have a question, Mayor. I, yeah. I apologize. I just wondered. I was unaware that there was going to be a, an open house for potential new drivers for Uber that was publicly announced. I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, City Manager, as you've already made a determination, and City Attorney and City Staff have already made a determination that such folks would need to be licensed, will you be participating in their? Uh, process there or can you do uh, or is it advisable to do anything to advise those people participating of the laws they'll be breaking in the process go for it city manager i'll go ahead and turn that over to our city attorney uh, and part of which we may want to uh, just circle back with the council on that and um, check back with our staff and then give a little bit of thought okay thanks i appreciate you asking that all right all right, we're going to move on to the second public forum, which is the Envision Eugene Forum. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Another 29. Just being fun. Are you going for you gonna read your part first? Yeah, are you gonna do it? Well, yeah, you wanted me to make a comment, right? Yeah, are you ready to make a comment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is everybody okay? Coherent and prepared? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
turn it over to you after I make some comments. All right. I'm, I'm, I gotta wait. You, you can go. Anything I can do to help? I don't know yet. I got anxiety about it this morning. If I can help in any way, let me know, please. Sir. Give us. Best of luck. I know it when I see it. <laughs> All right. Everybody ready? <laughs> if you're still having a conversation, would you please take it out of the room? <coughs> it. Thank you. Another Bubba Gary. And the beat goes on. City Manager. Next issue. Thank you, Mayor. This public forum is an opportunity for the public to weigh in on the prelim preliminary urban growth boundary recommendation for Envision Eugene. The preliminary recommendation includes four expansion areas, Clear Lake Road for jobs, parks, and schools, Santa Clara for a community park, Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill for single family homes, and Bloomberg McVeigh for single family homes. Throughout Envision Eugene, we have continually updated our analysis as new information has become available. And this has been a regular and important part of the process, which has involved thousands of staff and volunteer hours, primarily through the technical resource group. As you know from the email sent to you yesterday from Robin Hostick, there is some new information that is being looked at that could change the preliminary recommendation for homes. And while this information is still being analyzed and will be analyzed by the technical resource group, it has the potential to reduce or eliminate the need for, to expand for single family homes. Our intent is to hold tonight's forum and hear from people about all four areas that have been part of the recommendation since December 10th. If the staff recommendation for homes ends up changing through the normal course of the process, we will schedule an additional opportunity to hear from folks about the new recommendation. We want the council and community to be fully informed and have ample opportunity to respond to new information as it comes forward. And I've asked Robin Hostick to just uh, expound a little bit further. Great. Thanks, John. Actually, you covered most of what I was going to say. <laughs> Good job. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons we're taking the step of making a preliminary recommendation is so that we can get all the concerns and questions and new information out on the table now uh, before we take the step of making a, a big investment in all the work that needs to be done to do the formal adoption process, findings, and what have you. So this is actually the process working. Uh, it's, it's a good thing to have people coming forward at this time with new information. Uh, we're certainly committed to looking at any of that information as needed moving forward uh, to provide the best information to you to make, to make choices. Uh, and that's also... Um, that also applies to our partners in the technical resource group. Um, just want to assure everyone that this is a normal part of the process and virtually every state or every uh, community in the state that's gone through growth planning uh, kind of goes through the same thing. So um, as a reminder, new information could potentially come forward at any point uh, up until council makes a final decision. Uh, on the official process, and just a reminder for everybody, what, this is the preliminary staff recommendation that we're talking about today, um, and what we're looking for is direction from council so we have not entered into that for the benefit of folks here, the formal process yet. So I'm sure you're all curious to know more. We don't have time tonight to go any deeper on that, and we still have some analysis to do uh, before we can do that. Um, we'll be back in touch, I just say hang tight. Uh, and as soon as we have more information, we'll close the loop with you as well as the community. Thank you both very much for clarifying that. I appreciate it. So, um, officially opening the hearing. Oh
And uh, thank those wishing to speak during the public forum must submit a completed request to speak form to the information desk prior to the beginning of the public comment. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. You will have three minutes to comment. There are lights on the timer. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. We have 29 people signed up. First up, Brent McLean, followed by Craig Shelby. Good evening, uh, dear Mayor Piercy and City Council members. My name is Brent McLean and I live off North Delta Highway. I reside in Mike, Mike Clark's district. I am a commercial real estate broker here in Eugene. I was honored to serve on the Eugene Comprehensive Land Assessment Community Advisory Committee, which started in 2008. This is the basis for which spun into the Envision Eugene process. After 18 months of hard work, respectful to both sides of the fence, regarding the UGB expansion concept, we presented this to City Council and Mayor Piercy. <clears throat> the findings ECLA produced followed safe harbor related to each and every issue which were drafted into the final report. This was my first citizen involvement in a project like this and I was very proud of the respectful members I had the pleasure of working with. Our findings were unanimously approved by both the City Council and Mayor Piercy if I remember correctly. This is sometimes hard to find in our diverse community. If my memory, or excuse me, if my memory serves me correctly, ECLA's findings recommended a UGB expansion of 1,850 acres of industrial, commercial, and residential lands. This number was derived from following Safe Harbor with each and every aspect of the study. I admire Jason Dietrich who led the ECLA group and his hard work. He put his heart into this project knowing the final impact will affect our community for years. Then the Envision Eugene process started in 2010 to take the ECLA findings and work tirelessly to find, try and fit those needs inside of our existing boundaries. I hope you all admire Terry Harding and her planning team that have not just put their time and hard work into this, but their hearts as well. The hard work they put into this, I admire immensely. They have worked very hard to put together a final recommendation for you all to vote on very soon. This will be a policy decision on your part as a city council to move this great city forward and into the future. The city of Eugene has not been in compliance with the state of Oregon law that requires all cities to have a 20 year supply of buildable lands for future growth. The city of Eugene has been out of compliance as, since who knows when. The studies have been completed and the time to act is now. You will decide on the future of Eugene soon and it can't happen soon enough. Our great city has moved into this next economic expansion period and we need to have a minimum amount of land to grow this city into the future. If you truly love this city, Thank you. I'd like to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Shelby is up next, followed by Mike Reeder. Mayor, how many are there? 29. Good evening. My name is uh, Craig Shelby. I live on Bloomberg Road. Um, I live out. I have a Eugene address, but I live outside the city limits, so I'm not um, represented by any councilors. I'm ex opposed to the expansion of the UGB to include the Bloomberg um, McVeigh area. Um, some years ago, it was my privilege to act as the president of the Russell Creek Neighbors Association. Uh, beginning in 1997, our group, with the assistance of other neighborhood groups, the Thousand Friends of Oregon, Land Watch Lane County, the McKinsey River Trust, staff and students at Lane Community College, opposed the building of an armed forces center in the McVeigh Bloomberg area. Our association, after countless volunteer hours, thousands of dollars spent, 
um, was able to show beyond any doubt that despite its appearance, expansion into this area was not feasible. And as a, as a result of our efforts, on July 24, 2003, the Oregon Military Department sent a letter to then Lane County Administrator Bill Van Vactor stating, and I quote, the Oregon Military Department requests the withdrawal of land use permit number PA00-5806. First and probably foremost was the issue of traffic. This area appears to have easy access to major roadways, but at our stakeholders meeting um, hosted by Lane County, the Oregon Department of Transportation traffic engineers stated that no additional vehicles can go on McVeigh Highway without an interchange upgrade. And currently, the residents of this area are unable to access McVeigh Highway during peak um, traffic hours of LCC traffic. Virtually prisoners in our neighborhood, um, residents can't get to work and our children can't get to school on the bus. And we're told repeatedly by Lane County and the Department of Transportation that additional traffic signals on McVeigh aren't allowed, nor is a some sort of like a three-way stop. So I don't understand how the solution to our traffic problem is to add more vehicles to our roadway. Um, so please consider in the analysis of expanding the UGB in this area the cost of the several hundred millions of dollars that it would cost to upgrade the interchange. And furthermore, Bloomberg Road is considered limited access. There's um, insufficient right-of-way for improvements or additional vehicles. Um, also, much of the area in the um, proposed expansion is prone to flooding, and in um, 2001 and here at Harris Hall we submitted evidence of that, photographic evidence that there's, there's that area is prone to flooding. We also hired Dr. Ether, Ethan Perkins to conduct our own environmental assessment. Dr. Perkins is considered an expert on Willamette Valley ecosystems and documented that within the area considered for expansion the presence of critical habitat for endangered and protected species. The properties in this area are very rural in nature and include. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Reeder is next, followed by Pete Miller. Good evening, Mayor Piercy, City Council. My name is Mike Reeder with the law firm Arnold Gallagher here in Eugene. I'm here on behalf of Joe Gagne III and the Gagne family partners that own property in West Eugene and here to speak tonight regarding that property. And we'd like to the City Council to respectfully um, reevaluate the recommendation that has been provided to you by city staff to include only expanding the urban growth boundary into the Bloomberg, McVeigh, and Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill area. My client owns 77 acres of property that is currently within the city limits and the urban growth boundary and 200 acres that are outside the urban growth boundary that are adjacent to the Hynex facility and adjacent to the urban growth boundary to the north and to the east. City staff has given the city council uh, two reasons for why this property should not be considered to be brought into the urban growth boundary. The first issue that has been raised is the state criteria to bring in property. And this property that we're discussing uh, in the Willow Creek Hills area that my client owns is designated forest. I have provided you with a, an exhaustive analysis in a letter dated December 9th where I've explained how the city council has the discretion, has the legal authority to make a policy decision to include the Willow Creek Hill study area that includes 76 acres of rural residential as well as the 200 or so acres of resource property. And I've outlined that exhaustively in, in my letter. So I just want to summarize briefly, you have two options. State law allows you to bring in resource property along with the exception property, or in this case, rural residential, in order to make a complete community. I invite the city council to go out and see this site and see it for what it is. It's designated forest, but the, re but the resource property that's designated forest is not actively managed for forest. And the reason is because it's bounded on two sides by the urban growth boundary and encircled with rural residential on the other two sides. It makes no sense from a silviculture, social, and economic standpoint to utilize this property for active forest management. It has poor soils. Other members of our, our team will discuss 
those uh, issues. But there's also another legal option that allows you to bring this property in, and it's also in my December 9th letter, and I encourage you to take a look at that. And it, it falls in line with the triple bottom line analysis that was provided to you in the, on the December 10th City Council meeting. We ask you to consider this property the same way you're considering the LCC Basin Bloomberg McBay property, and we encourage you to take a careful analysis of that. Thank you. Thank you. Pete Miller is next, followed by Colin McArthur. Good evening. I'm Pete Miller. I'm with uh, KPFF Consulting Engineers, and I'm with the uh, Little Creek Hills study area team. Um, you've been provided a handout, and you can follow along. Um, the Willow Creek study area, it's our understanding, was dismissed from consideration because it was too costly to serve, and we were told there's not enough bang for the buck. However, uh, using information from the city's Envision Eugene website, when you compare that to the uh, Bloomberg McVeigh area, cost to serve, it's actually $6 million cheaper to serve. If you look at it on a, a per unit basis, the uh, Willow Creek area can accommodate all 534 homes that are being proposed. Um, that equates to about $27,000 less per unit to serve uh, the Willow Creek area um, as opposed to the uh, Bloomberg McVeigh area. Um, I'd also like to touch on uh, some other aspects, forest land, wetlands, and transportation. The um, the Willow Creek Hills um, is designated forest land, but most of it is not uh, densely covered. Um, it's not conducive to uh, forest operations as it's surrounded by urban uses and also adjacent to the Hynix plant. Um, in comparison, there are several acres of uh, forest at the uh, Bloomberg McVeigh area that I would like you to consider as well. Regarding wetlands, um, the Willow Creek Hills area um, has few wetlands and they're mostly in isolated areas and they're easily protected um, as water resource elements. Um, however, the Bloomberg McVeigh area was originally called uh, Russell Creek and Russell Creek um, encumbers a significant amount of the uh, area that's proposed for development. And the uh, quality, quantity, and location of the wetlands are a significant barrier to development. Um, also, transportation is a, a significant factor. If you look at the uh, West 11th uh, Highway 126 area, there are plans to improve from Terry Street to uh, Green Hill, and then ODOT has plans to in improve uh, from there to Vanita. Um, however, if you look at the uh, Bloomberg McVeigh area, uh, Lane County actually has plans to realign uh, McVeigh Highway through the uh, Bloomberg McVeigh study area. ODOT has no plans uh, to upgrade the interchange at I-5, and it's not clear what's going to happen in this area from a transportation standpoint. Thank you. Next up is Colin McArthur, followed by Steve Faust. I'm Colin McArthur with Cameron McCarthy Landscape Architecture and Planning. My address is uh, 160 East Broadway. We've been working with the Willow Creek Study Area team to develop a vision for the property. Uh, the framework is based on the area planning that was done by the city as part of the Crow Road project and the elements to make up a complete community. Willow Creek Hills, as Mike noted, is 284 acres. 77 acres are located inside the UGB and composed of medium density and low density. 200 acres are located right outside the UGB. The property presents a unique opportunity to plan for and create a complete community. We have a willing and enthusiastic property owner, one who is invested in the community, and one who is willing to invest in amenities that will attract residents and businesses. We have the ability to provide master plan coordinated development that can Im implement complete, complete community characteristics. The larger vision delivers a variety of housing types and levels interspersed throughout the study area. It provides housing that is proximate to existing transit, MX, and employment centers, it integrates parks and open space and trails, all within a complete walk walkable neighborhood framework. The property features a prominent tree-lined ridge that extends from West 11th uh, to the ridge-lined open space system. Within the site, the city's parks, recreation, and open space plan identify a neighborhood park at West 11th and the ridge-lined open space corridor as key acquisition <coughs> priorities. Uh, the Willow Creek Hill study area is proximate to jobs, at Green Hill Technology Park, the former Hynix site, 
enterprise zones and the Clear Lake exp expansion area. Excuse me. It is close to schools and urban services and is sited along a major transit corridor. The vision meets Eugene's future housing needs while setting aside land for parks, open space, and connections. Expansion at this location can deliver opportunities on a community-wide scale. Growth can provide recreational and complete community amenities that will attract <coughs> residents at all, of all levels. Development can provide housing that is desired by Eugene's future residents. We urge you to consider the merits of this site. Thank you. Steve Faust is next, followed by Arnold Kogan. Good evening. My name is Steve Faust with uh, uh, Kogan Owens Green, a consulting firm in Portland, <coughs> Oregon. Um, Mayor, council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to kind of <clears throat> touch in summary on what uh, my colleagues have mentioned tonight. First, that Willow Creek Hills is a legally viable uh, site for urban growth boundary expansion, um, and that we look forward to um, seeing it included in analysis um, along with um, the Bloomberg McVeigh site. We believe that our site has a number of really positive environmental, um, energy, economic, and social consequences. Um, Pete mentioned many of those, including its uh, lower cost to serve. I also want to mention, again, the tremendous um, economic opportunity that this presents uh, being near a number of uh, employment areas as well as the Hynex site and really leveraging that um, existing city investment in the area. <clears throat> also, that, that proximity to employment centers that proximity to transit um, presents an opportunity to reduce vehicle miles traveled, so yet another benefit of the site. Um, really, um, I think in our analysis, it appears of all the sites that were considered at the beginning of the process to be the most sustainable from a triple bottom line um, perspective. Um, again, this is a unique opportunity to work with um, a willing um, and enthusiastic uh, property owner um, who wants to create a complete community um, in line with other communities that or other neighborhoods that um, Eugene residents and, and workers love and enjoy. Um, so we urge you to consider the Willow Creek Hills area. Thank you. Arnold Kogan is next, followed by Mia Nelson. Uh, good evening. My name is Arnold Kogan, and um, I'm a founding principal with the Portland consulting firm Kogan Owens Green, and we're working with the Willow Creek Hills study area team. Uh, I've, been, I've been retained by the Gagne family on behalf of the DAG Trust Partnership. I was asked to review the Envision Eugene Urban Growth Boundary Expansion Process to accommodate the need for single-family housing over the 20-year planning cycle. I was Oregon's first planning coordinator under Governor Tom McCall and the first director of the State Department of Land Conservation and Development. This was when Oregon's land use program was developed to meet the requirements of Senate Bill 100 passed by the legislature in 1973. While working with Governor McCall, I helped draft Senate Bill 10 four years earlier. It contained the state planning goals eventually incorporated into Senate Bill 100. And for the last 40 years, as a private consultant, I've been involved with UGB expansions throughout the state. I can assure you that UGBs were never meant to be static and unchanging. Neither were they intended to prohibit or discourage growth. Instead, their purpose is to accommodate urbanization and employment while conserving resources. No growth is not an option. Smart managed growth is. State planning goal, which deal, state planning goal 14, which deals with urbanization, spells out how communities must create and change their UGBs over time. And the UGB amendment process is an orderly way for cities and counties to accommodate anticipated changes in population, respond to evolving environmental conditions, and respect the needs and desires of the public. In other words, arbitrary efforts to constrain or reduce expansion of future economic growth <clears throat> is not in keeping with the spirit of Senate Bill 100 or the intent of Goal 14. 
Smart growth, such as the Clear Lake expansion area, for example, links areas of future economic growth with existing or new residential development. All this while minimizing the impact of existing services, achieving economies of scale, and providing for the efficient use of land. The Willow Creek Hills study area, including my client's 284 acres, offers the city that opportunity. As a complete community, it is superior to all other study areas and complies with the seven pillars of Envision Eugene and the locational factors of Goal 14. Based on my professional experience and personal review of the work undertaken by our team, the Willow Creek Hill study area has clear and unambiguous advantages. And I recommend that the city, can I just finish the sentence? I recommend that the city place it back on the short list of candidate sites for UGB expansion and through a transparent alternative analysis, bring the Willow Creek Hill study area Thank into you. the UGB. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Nelson is next, followed by Susan T Tavakulian. Uh, good evening, I'm Mia Nelson, representing 1000 Friends of Oregon, P.O. Box uh, 51252 in Eugene. Uh, I've been involved with uh, Envision Eugene for about five years. I know many of you have been at it even longer, and it's tempting at times to think that we're near the end of the process, but in truth, we're still at the beginning, or at least we're supposed to be. Um, the formal hearing process hasn't even started, and many people who would be the most affected by your decision are just now getting involved. There's going to be new information to consider and new perspectives. The work that has been completed might be questioned and problems might be uncovered. The draft proposal might be the wrong proposal. And yes, it's late and we're all tired, but I hope that you will remain genuinely open to changing your minds. Let it still be possible for those who step up to this podium to have a real chance to influence the outcome. I came here tonight to ask you for a real discussion about the outdated 5545 housing mix. I have heard some people say that it's too late now to change that. I have even heard some say that the change it would be to renege on a prior commitment to the single family home building lobby. And I hope none of you believe that. I don't. Uh, since your last housing mix discussion, staff has collected six more years of building permit data. I've seen this data. Have you? Um, if you haven't, then you're operating on very old information. And if you haven't, I hope you'll ask yourselves why you're being asked to make a decision without seeing that new data. It is compelling. It should be considered. The data show that even if 55% of all new houses built from this point to the end of the planning period are single-family homes, overall, over the 20-year planning period, we will, we will come out at the other end with about a 50-50 housing mix. That's because we've had two years already of the planning period at very high multifamily rates. If you stay with a 55-45 mix, Eugene's planning will be out of step with the community's actual housing needs. Why does this matter? Because the consequences of underplanning for multifamily are much worse than underplanning for single family. If it proves necessary, you can always tack on more single family land at the edge of the UGB, but that doesn't work for multifamily. It needs to be close in, near good transit, schools, and other urban services. And it often requires much more planning to address neighborhood compatibility concerns. And that planning takes time. Every other large city in our area is planning for greatly increased multifamily. Springfield and Albany are planning for only 52 and 47 percent single family, despite current mixes of over 60 percent. Corvallis is planning for only 50 percent. These cities know powerful demographic changes are altering the housing market. Don't let Eugene get left behind. We simply do not have the multifamily land that we need. Please ask your staff to provide you with the six additional years of building permit data and consider revising the housing mix based on that data. Thank you. Susan Tavica, I'm saying this wrong, and I don't know how many times we've, we've had you here, so it's a, it must be the hour. At any rate, welcome. Good, good evening. I'm Susan Tavacoli, and president of the League of Women Voters of Lane County. Thank you for the opportunity to comment again on Envision Eugene, specifically on the staff recommendation for expanding the city's urban growth boundary to accommodate the projected need for land for jobs, parks, schools, and single-family homes. 
The League supports the staff recommendation but has some concerns. With regard to land for jobs, we believe it is appropriate to expand the urban growth boundary to include the land near the Eugene Airport to make larger par parcels available for industrial and commercial activities as long as measures are adopted to ensure compatibility with existing businesses and nearby neighborhoods and to preserve parcels large enough to accommodate targeted industries. Many jurisdictions in the metropolitan area are seeking to provide additional land for employment needs. However, co coordinated planning for the needs of the entire region seems to be lacking. We encourage the city to work collectively with other entities to address such needs. With regard to housing, the staff recommendation that the urban growth boundary be expanded by 260 acres for land for single family homes is driven by council direction to plan for a housing mix in future developments of 55% single family homes and 45% multifamily homes. Achieving this mix was expected to slightly increase the multifamily percentage in excuse me, in the entire housing stock. New construction statistics from 2001 to the present reveal significant fluctuations in the mix, reflecting a single family housing boom, a period of recession and foreclosures, and intense building of student housing. It is difficult to determine what this recent shift to multifamily construction means for the future. However, when the number of new student housing projects is expected to be limited, however, the however the number of new student housing projects is expected to be limited. Therefore, the League is not recommending that the Council revisit the housing mix decision at this time, but would not be opposed to such a review. Monitoring the actual mix of housing constructed in the future will be important to identify trends and appropriate city responses, and we suggest that a mid-course review and possible revision of the decision might be in the community's best interest. The areas recommended for expansion of the UGB for single family housing were identified using legally required criteria. Our primary concern is the estimated high cost per home to provide urban level services to the Bloomberg McVeigh area. Other expansion areas that were considered had similarly high or higher costs except for the Bailey Hill Gimple Hill expansion area, which will not require the same level of investment. A critical task for the Council, if this UGB expansion is approved, will be to analyze the infrastructure needs of all areas that the City plans to annex. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kendall Blake is next, followed by Bill Kloos. Hello, my name is Kendall Blake and I'm a resident of Eugene and uh, North River Road, Santa Clara area. Um, I have some interest in the Clear Lake Road expansion. Uh, that's a classically industrial area. Um, you know, it's on the way to our airport and also to one of our greatest uh, wildlife refuges within our close boundaries. And so I just think that there's a great opportunity to make smart decisions in what kinds of industry go there and also um, how to blend people and those places together for more access towards our airport and those other resources. So I'll keep my comments short. And I'd like to appreciate the staff. Um, I've been personally contacted and consulted a couple of times. It feels good to have a say. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Clues is next, followed by Bob Katosh. Mayor, Councilors, Bill Close, 375 uh, West 4th Avenue, Eugene. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of uh, Eugene Sand and Gravel. I had staff distribute to you today an uh, email copy of a two-page letter that has two pages uh, color attachments. And tonight I had staff give you a hard copy of that so you can have something to hold on to. Uh, we're suggesting that you ask the staff to take a closer look at uh, the Eugene Sand and Gravel property that is right behind the county buildings on Delta Highway. If I could have you turn to the graphic attached to my letter, uh, what you'll see is a much bigger area than that. The 35 acres that we're suggesting you add is open, high, dry, adjacent to Delta. And it's sitting right there behind the county property that you can see on this map. The balance of the Eugene Sand land in this area is that big area to the north and then the green area to the south 
it goes all the way down to uh, Beltline. The area, in addition to the uh, 35 acres that we're also suggesting come in, is about, is about 120 acres or so. Uh, and then there's the land that's already inside UGB, which is the green color area that's adjacent to Beltline. We're suggesting that if you bring in the 35 acres, that my client is committed to getting the balance of the Eugene sand land there into public ownership. So that would be the green land that's already inside the UGB, which the city is trying to buy now, plus the 120 acres or so um, of um, other land to the north. So the sea would really be picking up about 150 acres or so of, uh, of uh, parkland, riverfront land, and at the same time bringing in the 35 acres for actual urban development. The reason this makes legal sense is because the soils and the 35 acres is not agricultural soils. It's reclaimed mining land. And it's completely defensible when the state looks at this to say that you're bringing in land that has non-agricultural soils, reclaimed mining land, before you bring in good agricultural soils out by the airport. How would, what kind of defense would you give the state if they asked you why you didn't do that? It's the right decision to make. Plus, as I said, the city would be acquiring eventually the additional 150 acres or so of uh, riverfront land. So please ask staff to take a closer look at it. It's the right decision to make. I think it's completely defensible when this whole package goes up to the state. Thank you. Bob Katosh is next, followed by uh, Richard Freund. Uh, my name is Bob Katosh. I'm a resident of McMorrit Lane, part of which is included in the proposed Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill, UGB expansion. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about McMorrit Lane. It's about a half a mile long and slopes from about 300 feet of elevation to 700 feet at the top of the lane. There are 10 residences on McMorrit Lane. Some of the residents have lived there for 45 years. We're a very stable and cohesive group. We all know each other and support each other when needed. We have a yearly barbecue held at a different home each year. It's a wonderful community located in a beautiful area. Open meadows and forested areas. We love living in the country with all of the freedom and work that's involved. All of the residents on McMorrit Lane who um, are in the proposed um, urban growth boundary, which is the BG2 study area, are opposed to this proposed expansion. And I, uh, you should have a petition you know, with uh, our reasons for asking for you to reject that uh, proposed expansion, and it's signed. And the reasons why uh, we believe that you should reject the proposed expansion as our properties have a very low potential for further residential development. They're constrained by steep slopes, deed restrictions, wetland areas, creeks, numerous springs, and location of the current dwelling units. Nowhere in our area is there sufficient buildable land to justify the cost of providing utility service to the area, either by private uh, developer or by the city. But most importantly, we believe um, that the UGB expansion is not necessary in order to meet Eugene's 20-year need for housing. And really, it, it boils down to the housing mix of 55% single-family to 45% multiple-family homes. We believe that's outdated. It's based on 208, uh, 2008 and earlier data and doesn't consider the last six years of building, which was mostly multifamily. Even a <laughs> downward shift in the single-family mix would eliminate the need for UGB expansion. And, and I did include a graph of uh, the percentage of uh, family detached dwellings from 2001 to 2014, and you could see the downward trend is quite dramatic. Uh, and if you think about it, um, one of the neighbors mentioned to me, given the baby boomers who are downsizing and the many members of the younger generation who preferred urban living, we would expect that this trend would continue. Uh, so the individuals listed in the petition are in strong opposition to this proposed expansion and will consider all available options if the um, proposal, proposal is approved by the city council, including, including an appeal. Thank okay. you. 
Richard Freund is next, followed by John Brown. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Freund. I live in the Gimple Hill area uh, of Wayne County. Um, I'm speaking tonight to urge you to reject the recommendation to include the Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill uh, 2 area in the expansion of the urban growth boundary. There are at least two reasons to reject this recommendation. Um, number one, it's too expensive. When you add up the estimated cost figures of providing city services in the recommended area for Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill 1, 2, and Bloomberg McVeigh 2. The total is over $29 million. This is on the Envision Eugene website. $29 million. One alternative study area, the Chambers Crest area, has estimated service costs of $24 million. Thus, the recommended recommendation before the council will cost $5 million more than the alternative to provide the same housing capacity, 532 homes. I understand that cost effectiveness is not the only criterion for your decision, but in my judgment, as I look at the rationale for choosing uh, the recommendation presented to you, um, the reasons given for the preferred alternative do not justify the extra expense of five million dollars. Secondly, this recommendation violates at least two of the seven pillars of the Envision Eugene project. Pillar number four states promote compact urban development and efficient transportation options. The Bailey Hill Gimple Hill area has no bus service, has one tiny convenience store, and is far away from any employment centers. The inclusion of this area will increase urban sprawl, private vehicle usage, traffic congestion, and air pollution. Pillar number six protect, restore, and enhance natural resources. The headwaters of the east branch of Willow Creek flow through the Bailey Hill, Gimple Hill 2 study area. The recent environmental survey shows probable wetlands in this area. Further development here poses an unjustifiable risk to the natural resources of the area. Thank you. John Brown is next, followed by Mark Rabinowitz. Uh, Mayor Piercy, members of the council, John Brown, Ward 5. Uh, for the record, I'm here as my own and not on any board or commission I may hold a position on. Um, I've lived in the Ferry Street Bridge area for over 65 years, and I chaired the Willow Kenzie Refinement Plan uh, when we did the land use study, uh, talking about the land that Mr. Close talked about earlier. You have an opportunity tonight to ask staff to consider uh, the Eugene Sandland. I have no present or future contemplated interest in the outcome of that, but the 35 acres that you'll see that's, that's zoned agricultural, but it's designated park. It's the southerly most piece of that ownership. We misapply the parks and open space designation on it. It's privately owned, but it's for 25 years it's been designated as a park. And that's part of the property that we're talking about. The 30 acres they're asking you to move into the urban growth boundary is non-resource land. It's reclaimed mining land. It's it's been used as an industrial use, but it's no longer used for that. It's just it's it's it would be good because all services are there. The bus services there, the transportation is there, infrastructure is there. You just move a line and you've got 30 acres in the urban growth boundary. And then the carrot is that lake. You know, most of that 125 acres he's talking about is a freshwater lake, and I think that would be an incredible amenity for our community community to have and hopefully you can at least have that discussion and consider it so thank you very much for your time Mark Rabinowitz is next followed by Howie Bonnet the 20-year plan for urban growth boundary expansions parallels the federal requirement for 20-year horizons for federally funded highway expansion 
Another 20-year recommendation was in the 2005 <clears throat> excuse me, Department of Energy Hirsch report, which looked at the economic impact of oil depletion and said we would need 20 years of systemic efforts to mitigate these impacts. It also predicted that increasing oscillation in oil prices would be a sign that we had reached peak oil, which has now happened. The drop of oil prices is already idling fracking wells in North Dakota that require higher prices to make a profit, and this is likely to fuel the next price spike. We're in the eye of the energy hurricane. The storm is not over at all, and this is totally ignored by Envision and Expand Eugene. Protecting farmland should be our highest priority, assuming we like to eat. We have a lot of local agriculture, but we grow 3% of our local food, and importing food from other states, other time zones, other countries, uses a lot of fossil fuel. Yesterday was the official Martin Luther King holiday, and five days before he was murdered, he said, these 40 million poor people are invisible because America is so affluent, so rich, because our expressways carry us away from the ghetto, we don't see the poor. And the two square miles of expansion that you are going to approve are partly dependent on two large infrastructure projects. One is the proposed Beltline widening to up to 11 lanes at over a quarter billion dollars, possibly more. You could have the highway consultants here help with the contract for that. And the 11 lane Beltline would help facilitate the Northwest urban growth boundary expansion. There's also a long discussed plan for a $100 million plus expansion of the 30th Street interchange, which would pave over the area around LCC and be part of this. The Bailey Hill expansion would not be as dependent on highways, but it would cause ecological damage. And there was just another swath of forest on the other side of the ridge that was clear cut, taking out another bite of the Eugene Greenbelt. And it's been known since the cedars of Lebanon were cut millennia ago that logging disrupts the hydrologic cycle, part of climate change. Springfield's proposed urban growth boundary expansion to Goshen should be considered a connected action to this proposal, and they should be considered together for cumulative impacts. And are we just trying to make the region look more like California with the supersized Beltline interchange, more big box stores, capstone? Edward Abbey said, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell, and I hope we can rethink future plans before energy rationing begins. Next up, Howie, and then Brittany Quick Warner. Good evening. My name's Howie Barnett. Uh, thank you for listening so long. Uh, I'll try to make this short. Uh, this is a Envision Eugene hearing, I understand, and so I wanted to point out to you the existence of the seventh pillar, which is the pillar that calls for updating and revision and keeping on track about how the other six pillars are working to accomplish Eugene's goal. And so I'm glad to hear that the staff is already implementing that. I was an alum of the ECLA process myself. That ended in 2008. This is 2015. So it's time to implement that seventh pillar. Um, so just a couple of other points. Uh, if you divide the acreage uh, that's proposed for the residential expansion by the number of dwelling units uh, staff is proposing can fit in those areas, you, you'd come out with a number of about two dwelling units per acre. Uh, these are way, way out on the fringe of the, of the area. If that's not sprawl, then I don't know what sprawl is. I think that's really a bad way to go. I think it's necessary to find another way if we need expansion. Uh, the number of 534 relative to the total number of dwelling units that can be uh, accommodated within the urban service growth boundary is a very small fraction. So if we consider the 20-year planning period, even if that number is not adjusted, it's the number that would be needed in the 18th or the 19th year. So I think it makes no sense to to uh, provide for that now, it makes a m lot more sense to decide we're going to see how things go and if we need to add more, then add more uh, later. 
Um, last thing I wanted to say was I was at uh, Natural History Society talk on Friday. Uh, well, I'm at 100 at the university was filled to the brim, and the topic was soils. Soils are really boring, you would think, but that there was standing room only. Once you pave over agricultural soils, what? How do you get them back? Thank you. Next up is Brittany Quick Warner, followed by Paul Oram. Good evening, counselors. My name is Brittany Quick Warner from the Eugene Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for sticking here <laughs> along with all of us tonight. I'm testifying on behalf of the chamber tonight in support of the staff's recommendation for the expanded urban growth boundary near the airport for job, uh, job producing lands. The chamber has identified Im implementation of Envision Eugene as a top priority. As you know, the chamber has remained deeply committed to this issue since its inception in 2008 with, our, or with the formation of the Eugene Comprehensive Lands Asse Assessment. We've been active members of the community resource group, and myself or a representative of the chamber has sat on the technical resource group since its inception as well. The question of how we accommodate industrial and commercial land has always been an important one for our chamber. The recommendations before you tonight are a product of hundreds of community members putting in thousands of hours to flesh out where and how we want to grow as a community, and there is no debate, we are growing. I commend the volunteers, the City of Eugene staff, and the City Council for a transparent and inclusive process for working hard to first implement efficiency strategies to utilize land we already have here within our urban growth boundary. These strategies allow Eugene to accommodate more jobs in, inside our current boundary, excuse me, and more importantly, they create needed flexibility within our industrial and commercial codes. Now it's apparent that in order to accommodate a growing population in need of those living wage jobs we all prioritize, we need to expand for lands that can accommodate those jobs was frequently discussed during the many hours of the CRG, bringing back living wage jobs is critical to the long-term health of our community. It's clear that we need to attract these jobs and we know, what, we know that to do that, we need a supply of industrial lands. We've heard from experts in our community and within the region that companies are interested in Eugene. They're shopping and in many respects, we have a lot to offer, but right now we can't offer those large lots that they're looking for, sites between 20 and 100 acres. It's critical to the future of our community that we create a portfolio of these sites. The recommendation does that. We recognize that bringing these lands into the UGB is the first of many steps to prepare this land for development, and we would like to get going on those next steps. We strongly support these recommendations and urge the council to take serious the hard work and assessment of community volunteers and staff to move forward in creating the Eugene we've all been envisioning. Thanks. Paul Orem's next, followed by Bill Blix. Good evening, I'm Paul Oram, and I live in the Laurel Hill Valley area. And my comments address just one aspect of the proposal to extend the urban growth boundary into the Bloomberg and McVeigh area. Um, namely, that changing the urban growth boundary should acknowledge and reaffirm the Eugene Parks Recreation and Open Space Plan to maintain and enhance recreation, habitat, water quality, visual quality, and especially to link open space through trail connections. The Ridgeline Area Open Space Vision and Action Plan and other planning documents show a Russell Creek neighborhood trail connector between Bloomberg Park and Moon Mountain, which is to the north of it. This trail would then connect to the Ridgeline Trail System and the Ribbon Trail to the west, uh, in Bloomberg Park, LCC, Buford Park, Willamette Lane Riverfront System, and the Eugene to Pacific Crest Trail to the south and to the east. <coughs> this vision of linking by trail areas of parks and open space that would otherwise be <coughs> fragmented is a very good one and a very important one. It's not clear how this connection, however, will proceed from Bloomberg Park to the east other than along Bloomberg Road which will become busier if there's new development. Uh, while extending the urban growth boundary by itself doesn't create or negate ongoing planning for open space, the process should proactively support and not 
inadvertently impede parks and open space planning for future generations. Um, I just want the process to be proactive in addressing this as part of the uh, process of bringing in new areas into the urban growth area. I'm also mindful of the need for, for parks and open space in all parts of the city. If it were up to me, a future bond initiative in this area would reserve a portion of the funds for each part of the city, again, being proactive as opposed to reactive to deal with that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Blix is next, followed by Adam Jones. Good evening. Um, my name is Welton Bill Blix. I reside at 2295 East 29th Avenue, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, that would be Ward 3. Alan Zelenka is our, our counselor. Uh, <clears throat> I've lived there for longer than I can I'd want to think about. Um, I've written my comments, so I'll read those. Um, and that is, the city of Eugene has two iconic assets of inestimable, inestimable value and that give definition and distinction. The South Hills watershed, including Spencer's Butte and the Willamette River. <clears throat> Eugene citizens should take pride in these assets and do everything possible to preserve them and pass them on intact to future generations. Unfortunately, much degradation has occurred in the form of development that is insensitive to the natural environment and outright pollution of the Willamette River, which has been mitigated to a great degree in the past several decades. Insensitivity to the Laurel Hill Valley Basin has led to the encasement of Laurel Hill Creek in underground culverts that have construction on top and the potential encroachment of development on the riparian areas at the south end near 30th Avenue. We are more fortunate with the Amazon headwaters in that the city has purchased some of it and may purchase the rest for park area. The proposed expansion of the Eugene UGB into the Bloomberg McVeigh area across from LCC is another affront to the ecology of the South Hills and a probable degradation of the Russell Creek Basin. This sens sensitive area includes the juncture of both <clears throat> the Russell Creek Basin and the three branches of the Willamette River. The fact that the city would consider welcoming and even encouraging development in such an extremely sensitive area shows lack of foresight. If anything, new development should be discouraged and building restrictions should be considered. Once these ecological assets are lost, we generally don't have the option of recovery and mitigation is a poor substitute for the original. I strongly urge the Council to reject the Bloomberg McVeigh Area UGB ex expansion proposal and to consider special zoning restrictions for such environmentally sensitive areas. Thank you. Adam Jones is next followed by Teresa Bichelle. Hi, um, my name is Adam Jones. I live in Eugene, Oregon. Um, thank you for listening. You all look like you're dying up there. I can mm -hmm. understand. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Um, I actually came prepared. I came with papers and I came with all this data that I wanted to share. And to be completely honest, everyone else is doing that. So I'm just going to speak from my heart. Um, seven years ago, I bought a house on Bloomberg Road. And I lived there with my family. And we've since had to move back to the city for school reasons. But we have every intention of moving back. And since I've heard of the Envision Eugene project coming up. On one hand, I respect what you all are trying to do. I think it's a good move moving forward. And then it started happening in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about 400 houses down underneath my house. And you know, I'm just not interested in that. I mean, if you want to see what this is going to be like, drive up five and take a look on either side when you get close to Albany and Corvallis. I don't want my neighborhood to look like that. Go out to Danebo, look at the parcel and plot development that they've done out there. And that's the kind of thing that we risk doing. And, and the people of Bloomberg, possibly the people of Gimbal Hill, though I don't know anything about that, that's what we risk doing to these very special, very unique, very rare environments and homes that people call homes. So anyways, that's my that's my testimony. I think science and money sometimes works better, but honestly, think about this from the people who live there and love there. Thank you. 
Teresa Bishop, followed by Larry Nathan. Good evening, I'm Teresa Bishow, and I'm representing owners this evening of about 600 acres of land uh, south and southwest of Lane Community College. Um, we're requesting further consideration of expanding the urban growth boundary south of 30th to include land for LCC expansion, new college-related industrial uses, ancillary commercial uses, and housing options for faculty, staff, and students. LCC is zoned public facilities and is already committed to urban development. The surrounding large parcels are not prime agricultural lands, nor do they contain a substantial amount of significant environmental features. LCC has excellent transit. They already have the capability of providing additional services to residents and businesses in the area. In 2012, when you met in a joint elected officials meeting, LCC presented a master plan that was bold and visionary and it contained a projected need for three to four and a half million square feet of academic and mixed-use buildings. Um, I'm, I'm sure and I'm confident that you have been coordinating with LCC but I hope that you take another close look. There's two reasons that I've heard as to why south of 30th has not been looked at. The first is that it's not actually physically adjacent to the urban growth boundary but if Springfield can look at going west across I-5 I certainly hope Eugene will look at going south on 30th along the corridor and then and then bringing in the college. Another opportunity to expand the urban growth boundary would be to follow the city of Eugene Parkland uh, where the Suzanne Early Park is and the easement to also embrace LCC without impacting any uh, rural residential uh, home sites. Um, the state does give you the legal and political authority or policy making authority to expand the urban growth boundary to meet uh, uses that have specific siting requirements and over the last 10 years um, we have received numerous requests from industrial companies really desiring to partner better with LCC to help foster and, and utilize their training programs. Uh, major medical facilities for example have approached us on numerous occasions with being able to um, have a unique location near the campus. Uh, so if you, um, I know you embrace the concept of creating neighborhoods that are compact, mixed-use, pedestrian-friendly, and as you've walked around LCC, you've, you've been able to see that yourself is already there. And if you support places that are functional and beautiful, take another look at LCC and the adjacent large parcels. Thank you for your time. Larry Nathan is next, followed by Don Leslie. Good evening, I'm Larry Nathan. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Nathan Family Trust. My mother and father, Charles and Tony Nathan, bought their property in 1968 near Lane Community College because they thought it was a pretty good idea. Uh, I hope you thought it was a good idea too. Uh, I, came, I now live in Medford, but I came here specifically f to this meeting because um, I saw what Obama said just recently about community colleges, and he, he plans on making it free. Um, I know what happened when he made health care free to about 30 million Americans, so I expect you should refocus maybe some of your plans to the Lane Community College area. There's about 17,000 people who go to that college. I went to that college. It's my alma mater. Uh, after I got out of the service in 1972, I went there in the GI Bill. I tried like heck, but I didn't graduate. But I did get a good education in mass communications, and I ran a successful advertising agency for over 20 years. So I can tell you this. It's going to be busy out there if you let it be busy. You should refocus your attention to that area. Like me, I, I only got paid $243 a month for tuition and uh, from the GI Bill and I got an opportunity to go to Lane Community College and it's the reason why I'm here today talking to you. So I think the area that the young lady just spoke about on 30th Avenue, if you're sincerely interested in filling the needs of the people of this county, perhaps the state, 
I imagine they'll come from all over. We expect the President to speak about this plan in his State of the Union speech. A lot of people think it's a good idea, knowing Eugene as I do, I'm certain they'll think it's a good idea too as well. So why don't you all be heroes and heroines and see the people coming and prepare for it. You know, the only way to get there is to drive. Take a bus. Or as I learned tonight, take a taxi. <laughs> but um, you should be able to walk to school like some of us did. Or ride your bike. You can't do that at Lane Community College. Everybody has to take some form of transportation. I just can't make it over 30th on my bike. Thank you very much. Don Leslie is next, followed by Wayne Eckerston. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the preliminary recommendations from staff. Um, in respect to the jobs, parks, and school expansion areas, um, if we're going to expand in that direction, I would ask you to please pay attention to how this happens, very specifically to protect agricultural land as much as possible and wetlands, and also the health and welfare of the local and adjacent communities. Um, I'd like you to take care to mitigate any impacts. I'd like the, the how I think is really important with that whole, the, the problematic aspects of that area. Um, buffer zones would be um, helpful and encouraging, uh, looking at ways to encourage specific types of industry over others would be helpful uh, in terms of mitigating environmental, social, and public health impacts. Regarding the residential expansion, I think that's a different matter, and I'm very encouraged to hear that staff is uh, taking another look at and, and, and coming up with new numbers, hopefully um, taking into account what's happened in the last six years in terms of um, housing development. Um, putting hundreds of people in new areas requiring services of public infrastructure um, and the extremely high costs that are involved to serve those areas looks very economically unsustainable to me. Um, these costs are incomplete and it's been st stated to me over and over again by staff that um, it's not even the full cost that we're talking about yet because a lot of transportation infrastructure costs are not yet included in there. So we're already upset about the high costs. Um, and these costs can't possibly be covered by system development charges, so the gap will fall as a burden on city budgets that are already struggling, as you're well aware. Um, adding additional residential capacity inside the existing UGB with various types of infill, including more multifamily housing, will efficiently utilize existing public infrastructure, and this is a much more cost-effective way to add the relatively small amount of additional residential capacity that we need. Thank you. Queen Eckerdson is next, followed by Kevin Matthews. Hello, my name is Wayne Eckerdson. I live in the uh, proposed area in the Gimple Hill uh, Bailey Road area. Um, I came here to uh, voice my uh, opinion that I would prefer not to be included into that uh, urban growth boundary. Many of my uh, neighbors have done a great job of being more eloquent than I, um, and I look forward to uh, signing or reviewing and possibly signing the petition that they're going to uh, be proposing to you. Thank you. Kevin Matthews is next, followed by Joel Eboa. Good evening. Uh, I'm Kevin Matthews. I live at uh, Swan Farm in Dexter. I own property that straddles the urban growth boundary, so that gives me a dual perspective. Um, I'm, I participated with Brent and Howie on the ECLA committee. Uh, in the community resource group um, for well over a year on the technical resource group and most of its subcommittees. Um, and I'm here tonight primarily to support the rural residents and farmers who don't want the city of Eugene to sprawl onto their land. Now, the city manager talked about um, how the, the great process of updating information and keeping this um, inventory and all the factors alive as we move forward. And that's been done 
in many of the factor, many of the areas. It has not been done with regard to the actual housing mix. To whet your appetite on those numbers that Mia said you need to get a hand on, um, we're looking at actual single family mixes of 23%, 15%, 18%, 26%. That is so far away from the current council supported 55% single family mix, which is the most regressive in a comparable community in the Willamette Valley, that it really calls for you to take a new look and avoid the pitfalls that Mia talked about. You really have a choice here between going into the storm of blowing up the SDC budget to the extent that it would suppress development of all kinds across the whole city, pushing rural families off their land, paving farmland, and bloating the city's carbon footprint, or adjusting the housing mix, taking notice of the actual numbers that have been coming down the pike. With regard to the um, tailored expansions for schools and parkland, those are great. I don't think there's any, ever been much controversy on those. With regard to the industrial expansion, um, it's based on a false premise. That area around the airport is marbleized with wetlands. If you make that an industrial expansion area, it will be the West Eugene wetlands scenario all over again. Understand the history that Eugene once had the idea of expanding west into a wetland area. The, the generational project of the West Eugene Wetlands rescued the landowners there with federal money when they found out they couldn't make shovel-ready sites. Why would we even think about doing that over again? You got some more cut out. Thank you. Jolie Boa is next, followed by Jan Spencer. I'm Joey Boa. I'm here on behalf of Beyond Toxics as the Environmental Justice and Community Outreach Manager. Um, and I'm also here to talk about land for industrial expansion in West Eugene. Lane County is the second most economically disadvantaged county in Oregon. Our poverty rate is at 22.1%. It is important to know that out of eight possible tiers of poverty in the United States, Lane County is in the seventh tier, less than 1% away from being in the eighth, the highest level of poverty. A goal of the UGB expansion in West Eugene is to move in a direction that would support job growth in Eugene. We can all agree that we need to create living, living wage jobs, especially for families who are most vulnerable, <clears throat> low income and minority residents with children. However, the City Council needs to take a deeper look at the inequities of job creation in our city. West Eugene has been at the center of all industrial jobs. The Envision Eugene proposal continues this pattern by rezoning part of the expansion area between Clear Lake Road along Highway 99 and West Eugene to campus industrial and medium industrial sites. However, West Eugene is already proliferated with polluting industries that qualify for medium industrial zoning. Biomass plants, sawmills, wood product industries, metal recycling and shredding. According to government figures, these polluting industries pay on average wages that are barely at poverty level for a family of four which according to the federal government's official poverty threshold is $23,850. A family of four needs to earn at least $40,000 a year to constitute a living wage. The more low paying and polluting industries we put in West Eugene, the more we create disparities and the continuation of broken social cohesion. Already residents in Bethel feel disempowered and underrepresented. There are less bus lines, less grocery stores, no city supported community gardens, fewer paved streets, and far fewer health care clinics. The city is proposing more harmful industry when it needs to be proposing increased social services and skilled labor jobs. If the expansion area is rezoned to medium, medium industrial, the result is a continuation of disparities in career opportunities and air and water quality. There is a disparity in Eugene now between a concentration of low wage jobs located towards downtown and a concentration of low wage job factories planned for West Eugene. In conversations with city leaders and planners, the city is proud that downtown is booming with new restaurants, theaters and high paying jobs in the tech field and high and service industries. It is the responsibility of city council not only to bring livability downtown, but to extend that to communities who need it the most. Environmental justice 
is based on fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race and income with respect to planning and development policies. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the past where polluting industries burden vulnerable communities in West Eugene without the benefits of livability and sustainability. Jen Spencer is next, followed by Lisa Arkin. Yes, Jan? You're up, Jan. Oh, probably tired too. <laughs> uh, my name's Jan Spencer, and I live in River Road, and I compliment everybody for uh, their endurance. This is civics, you know, this is important. Um, I see expansion of the urban growth boundary is more of the same. It's kind of land use on autopilot. Um, low density suburban development is on the wrong side of history. Uh, demographically, economically, resources, um, it is on the wrong side of history. Uh, there are issues with VMT, vehicular miles traveled. We've all, all seen the the, uh, the maps of the further you are from downtown, the more you drive. It's going to stimulate more traffic all over town, not just out there in those areas, but coming into town, because probably a lot of those people are gonna be working in town. Climate change, uh, Eugene claims to be a green, environmentally sensitive place. Uh, let's see that as a reality. I don't believe it right now. Uh, more highways, more cars is not what history calls for. Uh, I came upon a really interesting statistic just doing some uh, some reading a couple weeks ago just to kind of compare what the United States is like compared to perhaps like Europe. The city of Atlanta with a population approximately the same as Barcelona, Spain takes up 33 times as much space. That's what we're dealing here with. Eugene is more like Atlanta than it is like Barcelona. The more sprawl, the more difficult, the deeper the hole to climb out of historically. So what do we do instead? Brownfields, we should inventory brownfields. They've probably been mentioned before. They need to be carefully looked at. Parking lots, there's lots of parking lots that could be turned into walkable uh, mixed use areas. Parking lots, let's turn those into, into residential and commercial instead. Block planning, uh, this is an idea the city of Eugene tried about 30 years ago. It wasn't the right time, but the city of Eugene actually paid a consultant to work on block planning to densify and redevelop existing residential blocks. Transforming suburbia, taking a existing suburban houses, which I've done on my lot in River Road, and uh, densify, take care of more needs on site. And how to pay for some of these programs, let's tax gasoline at its true cost of somewhere around 10 to $15 a gallon, the full internalized cost, and wow, we'd raise a lot of money you know, to pay for city staff. To, uh, to be working on these kinds of programs. Thank you. We're living way beyond our budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lisa Arkin, followed by Roy Biv. Lisa Arkin, Executive Director of Beyond Toxics. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here to talk about important considerations about community impacts related to developing industrial lands in West Eugene. The 2013 Lane Livability Consortium Report and the City of Eugene's 2014 Environmental Justice Issues Briefing both concluded that neighborhoods in West Eugene Industrial Corridor contain moderate to higher rates of health, economic, and social vulnerability compared to other census tracts in Eugene. Based on these assessments by the City of Eugene, this residential area is identified as an environmental justice community. The West Eugene residential area contains between 14 to 26 percent minorities compared with 7 percent in other areas of Eugene. Regarding health, data from Eugene's school health programs reveal that children in West Eugene are twice as likely to develop 
childhood asthma as all other neighborhoods of Eugene. Children in West Eugene are more likely to breathe air saturated with hazardous air pollutants, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, and fine particulate. West Eugene has poor air quality associated with its historical emphasis on heavy industry comprised of wood products and chemical manufacturing. Of the facilities reporting to the Eugene Toxics Right to Know program, all but one are located in West Eugene, and these comprise 99% of the annual air toxic emissions. Researchers at the Oregon State University School of Public Health are noticing this and studying the pollution and health disparities in West Eugene. In a study they conducted in 2014, published this month, researchers interviewed local residents, and uh, this is what they said. Eugene residents listed specific chemicals of concern as well as various industrial and environmental practices they believe contribute to poor air quality. Quote, even in non-asthmatic families, you can feel the air affecting you. You just kind of feel short of breath. Two, industry said they would keep their emissions at a certain level, but they're now petitioning to have those levels, thresholds raised. And three, emissions seem to get stronger at night, and sometimes you can see stuff spewing out a little more. So light to medium industrial zoning have already created environmental health disparities related. And we understand that the law requires a UGB expansion for growth. Let's envision a different scenario where we make the best use of class one and two soils and target businesses that will sustain and feed future generations. Pollution does not stop at buffer strips. Thank you. Thank you. Last up, Roy Biv. Roy? Perhaps Roy is not here, in which case, close the hearing. I just wanted to make one comment um, that we are uh, doing an inventory of brownfields. We got grant to do, to do that, so we are working on that right now. Okay, anybody else have anything they want to say? All right, thank you all very much. You see this right here?